Hey, Lucy. What's up, Tim? We played the Fallout games in preparation for today's podcast, but, you know, after dozens of hours role-playing in a depressing world that experienced global thermonuclear war, I think I'd rather just play a nice game of chess. Tim, I think you're being super critical. Welcome to another episode of the Super Critical Podcast, where we delve into the fun and oftentimes nonsensical way pop culture portrays nuclear weapons. As always, you can listen to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, YouTube, wherever else you may listen to podcasts. You may also check out our website, supercriticalpodcast.com, for a full list of episodes and the occasional bonus feature or two. My name is Tim Westmeyer, someone who studies nuclear weapons and works on nuclear security for a living. But I'm joined today over Skype by Lucy Steigerwald, who is an editor at Young Voices, a group that provides writing and media training to younger generations and young professionals. She's also a writer whose work you've probably read. uh, It's been published by Playboy, Reason, The American Conservative, and The Washington Post. Thanks very much, Lucy, for for coming on here. Oh, thanks so much. I'm really excited that I'm, I'm glad I demanded that you have me on as a guest. Yep. Lucy and I met over Twitter. She came across our podcast and... She said, uh, this is an idea that I'm glad exists, and I think you said you wanted to have it first. I did, yes. The name, too. Just the name alone is perfect. (laughs) Well, I only do things if I can make a pun off of them, so it's kind of how I operate. I felt the same way about, I found a Wonder Years podcast, and that was what I was hoping to do. But maybe I can demand my I think I prefer this. (laughs) Good. One of the reasons why I agreed to your uh, demand uh, wasn't just because you had a high charisma and did a speech check on me. But you also showed me your blog, which is the Stag Blog at thestagblog.com. And some of your writings at a series you did called The Apocalypse Project. Uh, I saw that you wrote some pieces playing the Fallout games, uh, Fallout 3, for the first time. I think that would make a fun discussion competition here. Do you want to talk a little bit about your blog? My blog, that's sort of the obligatory journalist's (laughs) all-purpose personal blog, Dumping Ground. Not to undersell it even more. The Apocalypse stuff, which I I haven't updated in ages because I have read and played and watched so many Apocalypse-themed things that I honestly, I don't know where to start if I wanted to keep that Apocalypse project going. It's quite robust. There's a lot of uh, Apocalypse in there. There, uh, There's plenty more that I have now uh, consumed. We're, we're going to talk about uh, Fallout 3, I know. So there's there's I have so many feelings and opinions about that. Well, that's great because we've covered movies on the podcast, we've covered TV episodes, we've covered books, we even co- covered a board game on our podcast, but we're, we're breaking new ground today by talking about video games. Many of our listeners may not play video games themselves, uh, although I'm surprised by the number of people that have reached out over Twitter that listened to the podcast that were excited that we were covering this, but those that maybe never played it probably still heard about Fallout because it's a very popular game series. It's the one where you role play as a character, just trying to make a go of it, you know, in a world uh, in the United States where it's like a, maybe 80 years or 200 years after global thermonuclear war. The games are known for being open world. You can shape how you want to play the game. They have very elaborate stories that based on the choices that you make. And, and I think the, one of the things that I remember most about the games is that the designers have this very dark and twisted take on life after nuclear war. It's one of my favorite parts of the game series. As opposed to a chipper take on life after nuclear war. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's very... Everything's fine. (laughs) So this game series was originally made by Interplay Entertainment. Uh, Then it was later developed and purchased uh, the rights for by Bethesda Game Studios, based not too far from where I live here in Bethesda, Maryland, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. We could talk for hours and hours about the Fallout games because there's so many of them. There's a lot of spin-off series. There's a bit of mobile game that came out a couple years ago. The big couple ones that we should mention here, there were two for the PC um, that were role-playing games. One came out in 1997. I guess it's not called Fallout 1, just Fallout. Uh, and then Fallout 2, which came out in 1988. I didn't know this until I was doing research for the podcast, but Interplay made a game in 1987 for all the way back with the Commodore 64 and the Apple II computers called Wasteland, an adventure in a post-nuclear America, which kind of sounds like a, a Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> but we'll focus today our conversation mostly on the Fallout 3, which came out in 2008, Fallout New Vegas, which came out in 2010, 
and Fallout 4, which came out in 2015. This is when the games kind of moved from these strategies, not simulation, but strategy, role-playing, turn-based fighting games, to this first-person shooter role-playing game uh, that you can see on the PC and consoles like Xbox and, and PlayStation. I don't know, did you play it on any particular thing? I played it on the PlayStation. I have been playing Fallout 3 and New Vegas on the Xbox 360 and 4 on the PC, so I mix it up. Is it any better one way or the other? Well, a lot of people are PC gaming aficionados and they like to do lots of modding. Mm -hmm. Like If you go to subreddits about Fallout, about half of them are... I have 47 mods in installed, and why is my game keep exploding? Yep. I was a little too green to video games. I I'm not quite ready to try modding. Um, I would like to get there someday, but... Well, the uh, PlayStation, I think, last year started to be able to get the mods, where you can say, I would like every character to have a gigantic head, or <laughs> I, I want all the monsters to be blue, or something. I mean, those are the crazy things, but you can do any number of... You know, I want the gravity to just be a little bit lighter, so I hop around. And just mm. see what the world is. PlayStation got that, but I would already I was already done with Fallout 4 by then, and I moved on to other things in life. No spoilers. I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say that I, I just threw a ton of mods on my PlayStation because you can get it now. When I was replaying for this episode, and I just and I and I did break my PlayStation's game, so I don't know what I did, but <laughs> I shifted back to the other games to to play again. It's a very popular game series. Won a lot of Game of the Year awards, high 80s and or in the 90s for Metacritic. For most of them, people like these games. Even if even if people have qualms about them, they tend to still say that they're they're pretty good. And I'm also happy that they did not go with the original name for the series, which was just going to be called Armageddon. That's way worse, totally. Terrible. It wasn't because the Armageddon movie had come out or wasn't coming out. I guess Interplay had another game that they were going to call Armageddon. But thank goodness they went with something else. Plus, uh, they're generally about post-apocalyptic. So Fallout is so, works on about four more levels than Armageddon would. So. Fallout tells you about what the world is after it takes place. Like the fallout of an activity. It's not just about radioactive fallout, but it's life after nuclear war. I have just a few couple questions before we get into the plot here. How did you discover the Fallout game series? Well, as a lady, it's a little bit lame to say... My boyfriend was playing them, mm -hmm. but my boyfriend was playing them. I believe he was playing New Vegas a couple of years ago. It was the 60s version of On the Beach, which is a traumatic nuclear war movie that mm -hmm. kind of got my interest peaked on the subject. I'm a history buff. You know, I wasn't disinterested in the Cold War, but something about that movie kind of led me more enthusiastically down a depressing Cold War fiction and nonfiction route. Boyfriend was just, he was playing New Vegas, and I thought it, you know, it looks really dated to some people, video game people today, because it's um, seven years old now. The background looks so cool. I, when he said, oh, I bet you'd like this, and... I'm a younger sibling and cousin, so I spent a lot of life watching boys play <laughs> video games. I'm never really used to that. Mm -hmm. I played them myself, but I kind of, you know, between the N64 coming out in 2015, I kind of took a mostly a video game break. And I kind of played ones that just sort of, not literally candy crush, but sort of metaphorically, the ones that just don't really use your brain in interesting ways. Um, sure. But I love things like Mario Kart, and not to um, impugn the majesty that is Mario Kart in, in any variety, but... Mario Kart does not have a very strong emotional component, except, oh my god, you hit me with a blue shell, and I was in first place, and I hate you. Fallout has a little more um, range, I'd say, emotional variance in it. I don't know. He, he said I'd like it, and then a couple months later, I was like, all right, let's try this. Spend the next month like figuring out how to walk, like make my character not walk in the walls and stuff. Mm -hmm. It won me over in about three seconds because I don't know if the makers of the Fallout games know this. I, I feel like they somebody does. The 1980s British miniseries, The Singing Detective, used the ink spots to kind of creepy, though not as overtly creepy effect. It's basically about a guy in a hospital a lot and he has weird hallucinations and it's totally unrelated to nuclear doom except for the, the use of the ink spots i don't want to set the world on fire and probably another song in this miniseries as well fallout 3 begins with that um in you're not even playing yet it's just the intro and it's panning back to that song um and you see sort of the ruin of uh of the world and i was like all right you got me game i don't even know what's happening but I, i'm sold yeah, the, the score for all these games are really good. 
Mm. I think they're some of the best ones that I have、uh, saved on my phone for just any time I need to work, driving. Usually, it's pretty good. They're not depressing songs. They're, they're, if anything, it's that contrast with what you、mm. think is, you see in the screen and what's happening versus the music that works out very, very well. It really does. Great. So let's get through this. It takes 150 hours to play the game. We're not going to do a 150 <laughs> hour podcast, hopefully. Let's go through the plot of the games. And as we always do, spoiler warning, it's really hard to talk about this game without going into detail. So if you haven't played them and if you're interested in these kind of concepts, come back to us in 200 hours. Do I cover my ears when you talk about four then? Because I'm only about 50 hours into that. And I, <laughs> I won't ruin the ending for four or anything like that. We're just Please don't.、Through. I don't want to have to leave. <laughs> you don't want to do that. But the fun thing is, is for these games, is I could tell you what the ending is and you'd have trouble getting to. That exact same ending as the one that I did. Oh, I know. Just, just,、yeah. just jump. I'll do my very best for that one. <laughs> so let's, let's spoil the heck out of the earlier ones, too. Okay, good. For the overall world of the game, it's similar to our world, but different. It's a timeline that you can imagine everything from human history is the same up until like right after World War II. I think it's like 1947 is when the timeline diverts. It's just from one odd, weird little trick is that they don't invent transistors. They don't invent like, the things in technology that allows for smaller tech, like a small laptop computer or having cars being smaller, anything like that. They don't have that. So everything is this gigantic technology from the 50s and the 40s, and we're just kind of stuck there forever. So everything in this world is not just stuck in this 1940s or 50s technology, but the, the culture itself is still, I guess they call it retro future. It's what they would think the world would look like today, but in. 1940 and 1950. It's like this, I think I think about it, this weird mix of Leave It to Beaver and then the Space Age. But the game doesn't just take place in that time. It takes, and the, the first two games are like 80 years after. But nonetheless, it's not, you're not playing the nuclear war. You're playing way after. There's advanced tech like lasers, and there's gene manipulation, fusion power,、uh, artificial intelligence, but all within those 1950s sensibilities about tech. Vacuum tubes and what people thought atomic power would do for the world. Back in the day. It wasn't until 2064 that I think they invent transistors, so tech is still stuck.、Uh, for a lot of people, this is probably their first entry point into nuclear culture and nuclear weapons. If you look on YouTube at things like there's an actual cartoon、um, civil defense sort of what to do when you know, all the goes down type of ads, and you'll see scores of people commenting, oh, OMG, it's just like Fallout. And like three <laughs> historians or experts of other kinds being like, oh my God, it's not Fallout. <laughs> like, this is the real thing. <laughs> and they're all exasperated. It's funny. I've seen this several times. For the record, I will say that that was not me in those <laughs> comment threads because I don't go and I don't touch YouTube comment threads. Oh, good. That's good. In an alternate reality that's not too different than ours. I can see myself doing that. <laughs> yeah. So of, of the Fallout games, I think. Before we get into the plot of everything, there's some things that I think are important to get the context here because this is why thematically these games are so powerful. So, features of the game story first. It's very much however you want to play it, you can play it that way. At least that's the themes of Fallout 1 through New Vegas. I think Fallout 4 has a little less of that. You can either play as a good character, an evil character, you know, neutral. You can play as a, a warmonger, criminal. You can play as someone who's just like a A mass murderer, and that's just the way that you operate in this game, and that's the way you decide to survive. Or you can go around and be a, a, like a, a Mother Teresa saving everybody from the nuclear wasteland, kind of however you want to play. You can also play it differently with weapons. You can do swords, guns, punching, armor, but you're slow, no armor, and you're fast. Lasers, sniper rifles, anything you really want to do, you can do that. I don't know. Do you have a particular preference? I don't go for full on realism because I'm invariably carrying like eight guns、yeah. and three swords, 20 different kinds of ammo. It's really hard. I tend to actually do a lot of eventually turning to sniper skills and also、uh, like melee weapons. I like to do energy weapons. And、I never do energy weapons. I, I don't love, know why. I just love it when you shoot an energy weapon at some monster or something and they just turn into green goo.、Mm-hmm. Just one of my favorite things in the world. It's true. It does happen. And one of my other things I like about the game are the dialogue interactions with, with the character. And when you interact with somebody, you don't just have you know, one choice of saying you know,、uh, yes, no. It's always a variety of different things you can do. 
usually there's four answers to every question and they're sometimes yes that sounds great i'm a do-gooder i'll help you out whatever you want and then there's ranges all the way down to you no screw you i'm gonna punch you right now <laughs> it's usually the, the range of responses that you can do um so i like that i like the fact that it's very nuanced and it can affect how you play out your mission because if you are mm -hmm. nice to someone they may give you a tip on how to help or they'll come in and save you or they'll give you an item or if you're kind of a jerk to everybody then they'll you can do my mission and i'll give you some money but but uh, i don't really want to help you that much more i like that <laughs> point to it and there's also so many side missions so many side missions that you can ignore the actual main plot of the game as soon as you start the game and you go okay great i'm not even going to touch that and as you mentioned earlier item management is a big thing <laughs> you're always constantly when you go into a room you look in a drawer to see what kind of items are going to be there. And it's all random. Maybe there's a clipboard. Maybe there's some glue. Maybe there's, I like how they call pre-war money that has value of like nothing. <laughs> You're always constantly looking for things when you fight an enemy and you defeat that enemy. You go up and you try to see, oh, what do you got on you? So it turns even like good characters into hoarders and looters of people's bodies. I am always encumbered. I am very greedy. It's hard not to just carry everything. Yeah. You can carry everything. You can only carry up to like a certain point, and then <laughs> everything after that. You can carry it if you want to, but much like life, you can overburden yourself and you have to walk <laughs> really slow. In the games, there's things, at least in I think 3, 4, and New Vegas, there's karma. If you're a good character, if you do good deeds, and if you don't steal things from people, the world of the wasteland thinks that you're a good guy. So people that would like that about you, they give you free waters, or they, they treat you differently. But if you're a jerk, if you're someone who goes around killing people for no reason... The bad guys will like you. The problem with the karma system often is the game kind of encourages you to be a good guy because you can lose or gain karma. Though there are, um, for example, there are companions who will only follow you if you have high karma or even neutral or bad karma. So in three, when I didn't want uh, Liam Neeson dad to ever be disappointed in me and I was playing a <laughs> total goody goody, you know, there are companions that I, I never had, I've, I've actually never had to follow me because they don't follow you if you're too much of a, even though I was the warrior of the wastes, mm -hmm. the one dude in uh, the town was like, I won't follow you. You're Sometimes there's a character that's so villainous that you actually gain karma from killing them. Invariably, if you then try to take stuff from say their house or dwelling you lo lose yeah. karma because it's stealing the game didn't think everything through because that doesn't really make sense yeah you think you'd be okay with stealing from <laughs> criminals but maybe that's the message of the game is dead criminals that you're rewarded for killing but don't take their stuff it does not make sense it doesn't read all of the uh, ten commandments <laughs> maybe some of them it's a little fuzzy i mean it's been hundreds of years since there was a bible was in existence so they probably have to pick and choose. That's a tangential uh, <laughs> question that we can follow a yeah. long way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the world here. Obviously, some stuff, something went wrong. Some kind of little, little nuclear war happened. I think one of the things I like about Fallout is it didn't just happen. It wasn't just bolt out of blue. A slow buildup of, of years and years of conflict. And then there was a little nuclear war that didn't go any further than that area. And then on Sunday, October 23rd, 2077, a couple years, a couple decades from now, things took a turn for the worst. And they refer to it as the Great War. It only lasted two hours. You, you play Fallout. You don't even notice the time has passed and it's two hours. And you haven't even done anything in the game. That's how long the actual shooting war took place. But... Did not know that detail of the plot, actually. That's creepy. <laughs> a lot of this stuff is in side stories or a book that you can look at or ter a computer terminal that you can read or Fallout 1 and 2 stuff. Lore that's discussed outside the game, but it's considered canon. I'm going to go through this and it's going to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but it's just because this stuff's available on the internet for you to see all in one spot instead of having to dig, dig through six or seven games. But there was a nuclear war. Weapons were launched from the U.S., China, and the Soviet Union, which, you know, it's good for them. They're still around in, the, in 2077. <laughs> but it's really mostly the U.S. and China that are the big shots here. It turns out that even with nuclear technology, fossil fuels in this world were still very, very important. And they start to run out in 2050. As we kind of predict in our world, fossil fuels aren't going to last forever, and it's going to be bad when they run out. Well, this is what happens when, <laughs> when they run out in the fallout world. Nuclear tech and other improvements after World War II in this world made people's lives better. Well, only up to a certain point. They kind of got lazy and decided not to innovate any further. This is a fun detail. In 2077, gas prices were $7,540 per gallon for regular, not, not premium. That was $8,500. <laughs> Cars started to run on fusion power. 
but it was too late. One of those too little, too late things. It took, I think it was like 2060 when they started to get fancier cars. And by then they were too expensive and only the, the fancy uh, rich people in the world were able to get them. There was a rush to build nuclear power plants, but because they rushed too quickly, it caused a bunch of accidents. There was this big one in, in New York City that caused a lot of damage. So they decided, ah, we're not gonna go down that path. But what ended up happening was a lot of conflict. There was some sort of disease that broke out, a plague that killed hundreds of thousands of people. It probably has relating to some kind of biological weapon that went bad. And we have our first oil war, Middle East. 2052, there's a nuclear terrorist attack in Tel Aviv that wipes out that part of Israel, and, and of course, a limited nuclear war in the Middle East in 2054. Slowly building in the 2050s were not a good time to be around in this world. This is when the United States government starts to build vaults around the country, because it decides maybe something's going to go bad, even get worse than it is now. There's this thing called Project Safe House. The U.S. government decides to contract with this company called Vault Tech which is a, a, a nice, very non-evil sounding company that seems like a defense contractor that wants to build some shelters. And they build a bunch of community shelters all around the country. I think it's like 120 shelters, which isn't probably enough for everybody, but some people get to go in those in case something goes wrong. Um, the U.S. starts to build a ballistic orbital missile base or abbreviated bomb. I, <laughs> I love that. And it, that would drop nuclear weapons down from space. Uh, we talked about this in one of our, our previous podcast episodes on a Star Trek episode called Assignment Earth, one of the original series talked about um, orbiting nuclear missile bases. I just, but So all this chaos is happening in the Middle East. The United Nations, turns out, can't really do much about it, so they disband. The Soviet Union is in great decline, but there's still two people out there, right? We got China and we got the United States. And China wants some oil because some of the only oil that's left in the world is... I think in Alaska and Mexico, and we're not sharing. We kind of, <laughs> kind of say it's ours. Seems to me anyway, it's like a nod to Japan before World War II and the oil embargo. Because then China decides to invade Alaska in 2066. What do we do? <laughs> we annex Canada. We're still waiting for the excuse to annex Canada. So this seems like the perfect Oh, time. yeah. <laughs> Any day now. We invade the Chinese mainland in 2074. And this is one of the, my favorite side stories in Fallout 3, right, is the Anchorage mm -hmm. storyline. Yep. So Anchorage is this world's, I don't want to call it Iwo Jima, but they, they use that as a model for Iwo Jima for some of the DC locations in Fallout 3. But it's like, it's the place where, where the war turned in the U.S. favor and they were able to push China out from invading the United States. They invent these things called power armor. How would you describe power armor in the game? Well, the power armor is kind of the iconic look. Um, someone in power armor is on the cover of like every Fallout game ever. Mm -hmm. it, it's like it's a mech suit um, with a particularly more badass design than, you know, like the ones in Aliens or something where they're more mm -hmm. warehouse moving heavy stuff or killing big aliens. It's really badass <laughs> mech suits. That's the best the best way to describe it. But it's all run on this weird, almost not, I don't want to call it steampunk. Steampunk gets overused, but it does seem to operate a little bit like that. It makes noises as it's walking, and it seems like a hefty deal. You're, you're not too mobile in it, but mm -hmm. you're safe from various, uh, I guess, small arm fire and things like that. But if, if you're going for more of the sort of, shall we say, uh, Mad Max sort of vibe, it's not, sometimes I like the more tattered sort of haphazard armor just me and my dog sort of look. But if you want to be a, a, a badass, power armor is the way to go, I guess. And energy weapons, which you apparently favor as well. So I never liked the power armor because of that. I always find it, I don't like the, how it closes this, when you're in first person view, it takes up too much space. Because mm -hmm. it's supposed to be unwieldy, right? When I face some big giant monster that I'm about to fight, <laughs> then I'll put on the power armor. Yeah. I'm not that. So say we all. We have our uh, crutches. <laughs> 2077, at the end of that year, there's a nuclear war. It's unclear in the game. I think they give you a little bit of hints, but there's there's no definitive who started it. It just seems like the U.S. saw something coming and they responded. The United States had invaded China's mainland, so this seemed to be their last-ditch effort to to push away the United States or something like that. It was. It's not really clear. Um, well, that's you know a um, nuclear war fiction trope right there, right? We don't. We don't. Nobody even knows who started it. Just mm -hmm. sort of like happened um you you're teaching me so much about the background of the game from what you just said and it actually 
sort of justifies a little bit more some of the retro future nonsense, like hmm. with the nuclear powered cars. I don't know. It feels slightly more credible, even though it's still a little bit nonsense with the amount of detail they have that somebody thought up, even if it's not evident um, in the games all the time as you're trying to kill monsters and stuff. There's always going to be some kind of plot hole that gets created when you do alternate reality. Like why, if they had fusion cars, why would they run out of oil? And then, right. they, and then it turns out, well, either it's in the game and they explain it or the developers of the game had this thing called the Fallout Bible. So it was like mm -hmm. this conversation that one of the game designers would have with the fans and would say, uh-oh, we have a plot hole. Can you please give us a solution? <laughs> and the fans would say, uh, what about this? And they would say, that's great. That's the new excuse for this previous plot hole that we filled it in for us. One thing that wasn't a fun interaction was the Fallout of this uh, this war. There were four days of radioactive fallout that laced rain with radioactive particles around much of, much of the world, caused serious environmental problems. The water is irradiated. You can't even drink water if it's outside. Plant and vegetation life had pretty much died around the world. And there was a giant EMP, which they called the Great Blackout, electromagnetic pulse that shuts off pretty much all the cars and other electronic equipment around the world. That's kind of where we are, but some people got to survive. Some people either were too far away from where a blast took place, or they were in one of these Fallout shelters uh, that were built by the Vault Tech Company. Again, one of the, my favorite things about the Fallout world, there's these vaults. People are winning them to survive, but turns out most of the vaults weren't actually for people to survive. They weren't just these nice community shelters. They were psychological experiments <laughs> conducted by the Vault Company and parts of the U.S. government to find out how people would survive in tight quarters. There was kind of like a, a deep state group in the U.S. government who thought war is inevitable. We are going to have to survive it. And I think originally the idea was that they would build some kind of spaceship to fly away to another planet and just leave this world. But they didn't. They wanted some hard data on what people would do if they were in tight confined spaces. So they have all these weird psychological experiments take place in the vaults. Some of them, I guess, were fine, that there were normal vaults, but most of them seem to have some sort of some sort of issue. But that's one of my favorite things in the game is when you go into a vault, you're like, okay, well, what went wrong here? Uh, the one in New Vegas comes to mind where something went horribly wrong with, like, the, they were trying to grow lots of plants, and then something happened where you get these hideous, like, plant monster people that are really kind of unsettling looking. In 3, the idea is... That vault was supposed to never be opened, and it was an experiment, and I think the overseer being sort of totally in control. Um, and four, you get cryogenically frozen, so that one's kind of uh, a little different, uh, yeah. applicable to space travel, perhaps. I don't know. Um, well, so they ended up this group, which is called the Enclave. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But they had this plan of using an oil rig slash spaceship to go into space. It didn't happen. They changed their mind, and they decided to just... To do some research with these vaults and then emerge from the vaults and become the new U.S. government slash, I guess, world government at this point. There are some real-life counterparts to these psychological experiment vault research things. Uh, one of the things that was sent to me when I was talking with people on Twitter from a, a Twitter follower called at Distant Wolf, uh, he pointed me in the direction of the Office of Civil Defense, uh, a study that they hired out, the National Academy of Sciences, and the National Research Council, they held a symposium in 1960 where some of the best thinkers in science and psychology and defense planning and civil defense planning, they got together and their conference was called Human Problems in the Utilization of Fallout Shelters. So pretty much the same basic idea. It drew on human experiences from shelter programs, conventional bombs uh, that were very popular in, in parts of Europe, uh, as well as people that lived in submarines for a long period of time, so very isolated areas, people there were research stations in either the North or the South Pole. What was that life like for them? So they looked at that. They looked at challenges like food shortages, uh, sensory deprivation. If there was no natural light, would that cause people to go crazy? Um, how would you govern the inside of a shelter if it was separate from everywhere else? They looked at all these things. So much like the Fallout games, the general philosophy for this conference was Fallout shelters were not just about human survival. Because if you dig a hole and you hide in it for a couple of weeks, you can come out and you tend to be fine, but you're by yourself and you're, you're not really building a society afterwards. So it wasn't just human survival, but the continuation of society in some kind of way. One of the speakers summed up the conference by saying, 
We are concerned not just with the matters of biological survival, but with the problem of order, such as authority patterns, division of labor, cultural norms, social norms, and things with meaning, such as values, shared definitions of reality, communications, mechanisms. If we continue to think of society as simply a collection of individuals utilizing resources, then we have lost our only hope of attacking the problem of preparation in any societal realistic way. So I think that was an interesting way of looking at it. And as someone who comes from the, the libertarian perspective, do you have any kind of thoughts on, on that? I don't know if you really need to have a thought on that, but the idea that fallout shelters are meant to preserve some kind of order for civilization, and it's very much based on you're not just out for your own individual interest, but you're out for the community's interest. You need to put that ahead of your own self. Because fallout has that debate about whether or not you're out for your own or you're out for other people and which is the best way to live life. You are sort of a um, archetypal, I mean, the, you're, you're literally known as the lone wanderer in yeah. three. And you can have companions, but you can have, you know, just a dog or a robot dog or a robot. <laughs> or you can have humans, super mutants. I always recommend them. I mean, the thing is, though, is the people, you know, they're, they're talking about community there. And my, my, my first thought is, well, it's not the individual who's going to be causing the nuclear doom. So that's a bit rich. Yeah. I know that they did experiments. Um, I have a book that I haven't finished because it's a bit, the, the topic is fascinating, but the writing is a little sloggingly academic. Um, and it's literally all about just preparation for nuclear war. All the different mass drills that they did, mm -hmm. mostly in the 50s and 60s. A couple of instances where they had people live for 15 days in a, in a fallout shelter and see how they were afterwards. And a really fascinating detail that I never would have thought of that I learned was that even in what we imagine to be the square 50s um, and early 60s, you had people protesting these drills. Often it was on the grounds of the fact that if you are preparing for nuclear war and preparing for someone to survive it, mm -hmm. that implies that it is sort of acceptable as opposed to absolutely we're never going to let this happen because it will you know if not outright destroy humanity it'll cripple it in, in this you know horrifying apocalyptic way these people were saying basically we're practicing for nuclear war that means we're saying it's okay and mm -hmm. we're not going to do that and that i never thought of it in those terms before and i think that that i mean it was these people's job to think up Ha you know this this horrible what if scenario but you know the, again the libertarian in me and that is me I, I like the let's not even consider it aspect mm -hmm. um at least you know the people in charge are the ones who are likely to get us into some mess i suppose it's a little different now with you know the potential for terrorists like a small group with a rogue nuke more the 24 type of uh mm nightmare scenario but still just you you don't want that on the table you know even if you have to and if you're like me and you're morbid you think about these things like all the time what people would do and how they would react and how i would react if i had to go live in a bunker for a couple years or months even mm -hmm. um getting a little claustrophobic just thinking about that <laughs> <sighs> that that's part of <laughs> oh boy get some water <laughs> <laughs> fallout shelters are, are always interesting because you would definitely have that protest of people that are saying if you if you prepare for it, it's going to happen. Then you have the side of the community of nuke thinkers that say, you're right, we need to show our adversary that we will be willing to use our nuclear weapons uh, so that you won't use yours against us. If the, say, the Soviets came to the conclusion that the United States does not have the stomach for using nuclear weapons, because they're not ready. If they, have, they don't have a shelter program, everyone would die. They would decide... The Soviets could invade Europe conventionally because we won't trade Berlin or London for any one of our cities because we just we're not going to be ready to do it. The idea is, well, hey, we've got these fancy our shelter programs. Yeah, not everybody's going to make it, but enough of us are going to, and we're going to win the larger war of civilization and ideology in the end. One of the most convincing things I've ever read on this was the type of world that you would create at the end of a nuclear war using fallout shelter programs is there'd be such conflict at the end when people try to rebuild civilization it's going to be a dictatorship slash communistic organization because that's the only way that people can survive it's not going to be capitalism and it's it's not going to be democracy there's going to be some kind of martial law that gets created and there's going to be communes of people that are going to be forced to plant the crops that their this dictator says like, no matter what it is you end up losing so what's the point that kind of reminds me of I don't know the origin of this, but offhand, but people talking about space travel 
And, you know, there, there were the sci-fi tropes, and then there's the consideration of what it would really be like. And you have you often have the militaristic, hierarchical sci-fi, and you have the what is kind of libertarian, you describe it, you know, or the, like Firefly mm-hmm. is the best example of that kind of thing. Best example, um, yeah. <laughs> and just that, the, that if you, it, space really is so harsh that you might need and it hurts my libertarian soul to say this um some sort of authoritarian structure like like extra extra military type of authoritarian structure just to survive out there um and eventually you might reach a firefly-esque point where people can survive you know sort of without almost any oversight at all but space sucks a lot more than sci-fi uh admits Mm -hmm. so but like a a post-nuclear world wouldn't be quite as harsh, but if it was truly just like devastated, um, I don't know that I ever think that authoritarianism works better than not, but God knows I buy that it, you know, it would turn into that, especially mm-hmm. in a vault uh, situation, but also in miserable surface, you know, huddled commune of sadness type thing. Um, New Vegas, of course, has is the most directly about different factions and sort of different politics almost. Mm-hmm. Um, and not just, boy, it's depressing out here in nuclear doom. It's what are what are how are people reacting to this new world and who's trying to seize power and in what way? Yeah, and that's one of the strongest points about that game that a lot of people that really like that part of the series and don't like Fallout Three or Fallout Four talk about the clan or group systems that you can manipulate or work through. And I think that's a a powerful point of the games. One thing I'll mention real quickly here is cut along the lines of what you were saying is when we covered on the podcast recently the movie Threads, which is this mm. super depressing movie from I think 1984, but it was cool because it was the perspective of of a British audience and British filmmakers. And I had Tim Collins on, who is a PhD candidate at King's College London who's studying British nuclear history. And he uh, even submitted some questions for us to talk about a little bit later on. But he brought from the perspective of fallout shelter programs in the UK and defense planning and, and how they would respond to a nuclear war. Fallout shelters were there. They were community shelters. But they realized that the UK is so small, any nuclear war is going to devastate anything that they can conceive of being a civilization. We have these plans, but they're not going to work. It's going to end up resulting in some kind of dictatorship. There's going to be uh, food rationing. It, it, that's that's the best outcome for these kind of uh, this this world. So I think that's always an interesting perspective. And I would love to see a Fallout game that takes place somewhere else eventually. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it, Me too. It's just a DLC that takes place in China or a, a game that takes place in Russia or parts of Europe or something like that would be great. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Africa or South America. Some other perspective. So this war happens. It's not great. But one of the things that's very unique about the Fallout games, because of plot, because they need a world to exist 200 years after a nuclear war, is pretty much most of the bombs that were used weren't these giant megaton, 20 megaton bombs that one of them would destroy an entire city and not destroy like the the Starbucks fell down or, you know, there's a couple, maybe your, your house fell over, but it's still there, like vaporized pretty much gone kind of weapons. Instead, for some reason, and I can't really, I never really understood why they're all tactical bombs. They're these smaller, low-yield bombs. They seem like they're somewhere around 0.3 kiloton, which is one of the one of the references I saw in the online descriptions of the bombs that were used were, were these much smaller ones. So they left places like D.C. and Boston more or less intact, rubble everywhere, but the Washington Monument in the game is standing. They say about 0.3 kilotons, uh, which is at the lower end of what we have today, which are the B-61 gravity bombs. These are bombs that you can dial a yield up or down depending on certain features you put into it. So I used our, our handy tool, Nuke Map, which is a website created by Alex Wellerstein. Uh, you can pick your favorite uh, town or your, your, your high school bully's town and house, <laughs> and you can put a bomb on top of it, and you can change everything up. So I used 0.3 kilotons. Ground burst at the White House, as the game says that one of the places that was hit was was the White House. It's a pretty much a crater. And I pushed detonate, and I would see what would happen here. According to that, there'd be a blast wave out to 0.1 miles, which is a large area, but it would knock down the Washington Monument, which is interesting. So well, that, that's a there sm- you go. It's a very small bomb. These are bombs that are meant to be used on the battlefield to take out a, a tank battalion or 
some sort of irradiate this area so that troops couldn't move through it, so you force them to move somewhere else, that kind of thing. There are not the city destroying or things you would use to take out hardened targets like silos or uh, military bases elsewhere. If you let the game have low yield nuclear weapons, it at least creates the possibility that parts of the city survived. Although I imagine there would be a lot more bombs that would be used if they were tactical. So I never really understood that, but again, it's probably just for plot purposes, right? They need to have a, a world. Plus the lingering radiation after 200 years. I don't know. I'm not going to pretend I know my uh, my specifics of, of radiation at all, but I've heard rumors that um, Fallout 3 was initially supposed to take place directly after the hmm. war. Which might explain some of the um, trimmings of... It makes sense that DC would be hit particularly hard uh, in, in this storyline, but just that it's so radioactive still that it can kill you in certain spots and you still can't go where the uh, White House used to be. I don't know. By the way, Nuke Map, I love... I've definitely tested to see what the full yield Tsar Bomba would have done <laughs> to Washington, DC. Not good. Yeah, not good. <laughs> I, I had some weird comfort that I look out from my window and I can see the Pentagon and the White House. And if one of those are used, I would it'd be it'd be done pretty quick. I don't right, get, yeah. I don't get to have my Fallout adventure. No. I'd be a ghoul I, at some point, maybe. Uh, I'm near Pittsburgh, so I'll just be working in the weird slavers' pits, uh, according to Fallout 3. Or in a couple of other nuke things, Pittsburgh actually gets it, like in, in the show Jericho, a few other things. So I always think Pittsburgh will be safe because um, there's the supposed Andy Warhol quote, in the event of nuclear war, go to Pittsburgh because everything comes to Pittsburgh five years late. But <laughs> some fiction suggests that we also get it. So so Jericho Jericho has uh, it's Pittsburgh? No, but there's a moment when uh, one of our characters realizes how many cities were hit because it's kind of a we don't know what happened, we're isolated thing. Yeah. And he's um kind of crossing them off and he definitely, Pittsburgh is definitely there. It's so. on there. Yeah. I don't really like the movie The Day After. I don't think it's no. a great depiction of things. You can't really like it. It's almost a historical artifact. You mm -hmm. know, it's not something to enjoy. <laughs> but I don't even... I will cover this at some point, but I don't, I don't even enjoy it as a part of the, the genre. It's historically interesting, but at least that makes it thematically like this is in Lawrence, Kansas ish right. area. It's the center of the country geographically. Anywhere it could be hit because even Lawrence, oh. Kansas gets hit is kind of I've, thematically. I've seen that, but I'd forgotten it was Kansas. Jericho actually takes place in Kansas. I think it's worthwhile going through the stories because they're interesting and they show different aspects of, of nuclear history and real life applications of science and other challenges that we work through. And it's, I also just find it interesting. So in Fallout 1 and 2, with the caveat that I've never actually played them, I will play them. Fallout 1 takes place in California, uh, what they call New California, in 84 years after the Great War. So your character is, he leaves his home, which is Vault 13, and finds his way to, he or she, can you, can I don't know if in Fallout 1, if you can change your character like that? I know you can do it in the later games. I think you can. I played Fallout 1 for approximately 20 minutes before I realized I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I could be wrong, but I believe you can change your gender in any of them. So maybe that was something we didn't mention, is that in the Fallout games, you can basically customize your character down to how big you want your nose to be, how big you want your ears to be, any, anything like that. And the game adapts the story around that, which is pretty cool. So you, f you find your way to repair the broken water recycling system in your Vault 13. The cool thing about this one is you're given an in-game limit of around 150 days to find a solution. If you don't find a solution by then, it's over and you have to start over again. I think it'd be even harder than the other later Fallout games, which you can basically play for, we talked earlier, you can play for 200 hours and not finish the game. If you look for so, some solution to your water recycling plant, but you end up running into this mutant whose name is the Master, who was infected with this virus called the Forest Evolutionary Virus, or the FEV. It's this thing that changes your biological structure. It was supposed to make, I think, super soldiers, but then it's screwed up and you end up these giant mutant monsters that look like people, but they, they look like the Hulk, but yellow, <laughs> running around and they're kind of dumb. But they're, they're real people. You have a decision about whether or not you're going to destroy the super mutants or you can try to work with them and have them take over as the next step in evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess that's kind of the plot of that game. And ultimately, you can choose to either save your vault 
and the overseer thanks you very much, or you can destroy your vault, and the over- <laughs> overseer doesn't thank you very much. But either way, if you save your vault, they say, great, I appreciate that very much, kudos, but you're exiled to Oregon, because your stories of your adventures would make everybody in Vault 13 want to leave. So you don't end up there. You go to Oregon, which is not a, not a bad place, probably a pretty good place to be uh, in a nuclear war. It's close to Seattle where there would be a lot of nuclear targets uh, with our submarine bases and things, but mm. Oregon would probably be not a bad spot. <laughs> uh, so when you're in Oregon, you're a descendant to the character that you played in Fallout 1. You're called the Chosen One. Mm-hmm. So that's a lot to live up to. <laughs> uh, you're tasked with finding something called the Garden of Eden Creation Kit, or GEC. This would bring back parts of the world that were hurt by nuclear war and bring them back to the way they were before the war. So you go around, you look for things, you interact with this pre-war U.S. government group that we call the Enclave, uh, and you work to save your town. And I kind of don't know how it ends. Uh, It might be spoilery on that front, but you can probably choose to do any number of things or do any number of nothing and then just keep playing and roaming around the the wasteland. I played Fallout 2 for slightly longer than uh, the first one. I played it for about an hour but I hadn't figured out how to save, so I died <laughs> permanently. <laughs> That'll do it. You start in this weird temple thing, and even regardless of the absurdly different graphics, it doesn't have much of a Fallout vibe. And I'd finally gotten out of there and started to see the great big world, and it's just... you. I mean, you need to read a manual first <laughs> if you weren't gaming in, in the late 90s. I mean, I guess I was playing, you know, Super Mario and Sonic occasionally, but... Uh, mm-hmm. This kind of game, I just, it's totally unfamiliar to me, and it would take a certain amount of commitment for me to really get just the basics of it. So, and that's, we'll see. That's how I felt, too. I never, I honestly, I didn't play a lot of PC games. I played TIE Fighter, uh, mm. the, the Star Wars TIE Fighter game. That was pretty much the big PC game that I played <laughs> a lot. But it wasn't until Fallout 3, which I believe came out for the PlayStation 3, and, and, and Xbox and other stuff. This is the one I really want to talk about, because... I was living in D.C. at the time. I had just moved back from working on a political campaign. I just moved back to D.C. in Northern Virginia. It was 2008. I was in the video store because I think I was between between jobs at this point. So I had a little bit of free time while I was job hunting. And I go into literally like a Hollywood video that was across the street from me. And I see, oh, I've been seeing all of these Metro uh, subway ads for Fallout 3. Oh, nice. Metro ads for Fallout 3. Everywhere oh. in the Metro was Fallout 3. It was That's so awkward. Great. So I said, okay, I'll finally play this. I, I actually <laughs> took a break from playing games like two years or so because I was busy when I'm, I'm doing some other stuff, trying to make my, my life after college. And I rented the game, and I got out of the, the vault. I'm playing around a little bit, and I come up to these giant fire-breathing ants, and they just keep killing me, and I can't figure <laughs> out how to beat them. Because I didn't realize that the game doesn't want you to do everything all at once. You can, right. but you would, you'll die. And I got so frustrated that after a day or so, <laughs> I returned it to the video store and gave up. And I, I rented probably something much simpler. Um, so then it wasn't until a couple years later that I ended up actually playing Fallout 3 uh, all the way through. It was probably almost two or three years after it came out. In this world, you're playing in an area called the Capital Wasteland. All right, so you're playing a character called the Lone Wanderer. Uh, it's 200 years after the Great War. And you and your dad, who is a scientist, are in this Vault 101. And it's it's fun. The game opens with you being born. <laughs> you literally come out from the womb, and you get to pick your name and what you would look like a couple 19 years from now. Unfortunately, your mother passes away in childbirth. Your dad uh, raises you as a single father in this vault. And he's kind of working on this water purification system thing in the vault, and then he just, on your 19th birthday, he disappears. He, he goes away, and you can't find out where he's at, and you have to kind of follow him out of the vault, and you can then enter the wasteland, uh, and the game plays out from there. I think there's fun, there's a lot of not- notable locations in the game. Uh, pretty much every monument you can think of is there. Uh, maybe slightly altered for anything that took place mm-hmm. after World War II. It, it's different. So, for example, like Iwo Jima, the memorial there, instead of being... You know, Iwo Jima, it's Anchorage Memorial for that big battle that took place against China. Maybe they replaced it <laughs> after the fact. Andrews Air Force Base is there, uh, Georgetown, uh, the National Mall, even a lot of metro locations. Which I think it's fun because it's hard to tell the difference between the post-nuclear war metro and the condition <laughs> that we have today, which is constantly always being broken down, catches fire, things like that. But It's true. 
There's lots of metro locations. Northern Virginia is pretty well represented. You mentioned earlier about having watching your or your older siblings or uh, your significant other playing games. My roommate, he didn't play much games. He would watch me play Fallout 3 because I'd be playing. I'd oh, hey, hey, that's our office. And it was the, generally the area where our office would be. <laughs> and we always just, just, just that, was, that was the fun thing. So I, I really connected with Fallout 3. But one of the first places you go to is, this is, a, I think, a great representation of how you can play Fallout, is this town called Megaton. And it's called Megaton because in the middle of the town is an unexploded giant nuclear bomb. They say it's all tactical nuclear weapons, but there's this giant megaton bomb in the middle. So I don't, I don't really, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that aspect to it. Maybe there was one that was supposed to be, and it, and it, and it didn't work. So we got lucky there. Um, Maybe. But the town is built around this unexploded bomb, and you get to make one of the first choices you get to make in the game is: do you help them out and disarm the bomb, or do you basically look out for your own interest? Uh, this guy hires you to cause the bomb to detonate, and you get to blow the town up. What did you do? And the game I played was I did not explode it. But then, okay. of course, what I did was I saved it, <laughs> then exploded it and to see what would happen, and then didn't use that as my, my story. But this time I'm playing it right now, I am going to explode it because i got, <laughs> I got to get mine. You learn that your mom and your dad were actually born outside the vault and that they took you there to raise you in a safer place. Your dad, as I mentioned, is working on even a bigger water purification system, which is based at the Jefferson Memorial, because he says if he, inve- if he fixes this thing, he can basically turn the Potomac into a nice, clean drinking water source, which would be great even today because that river is kind of <laughs> gross. But that's kind of, I think, the best way to look at the game. There's, there's slavers and raiders that you can fight or cooperate with. There's this group called the Brotherhood of Steel, which I guess comes out of Fallout 2. That they're like a group of I, they're kind of like samurais in the sense that they, they have all these weapons that they collect and they're, they wander around the areas looking for things to help people, but they're essentially technocrats in the sense that they collect technology and they're all high and mighty about their place in the world. And they're usually the ones wearing the power armor. They have the power armor, Which is portrayed on all the Fallout covers. They're interesting because they're quasi-villainous in some portrayals. They're always snobby, Mm -hmm. even in their most sympathetic portrayal. But in Fallout 3, they're, they're the closest to being good guys and it's hard not to join up with them because you get a really fun ending involving a really big robot democracy is non-negotiable um it's a pretty fun ending to a game that's probably my highlight of my video game life so far i was it was just so good um i didn't want to i don't want i just want everyone to play it and not and not have me describe it because but brotherhood of steel though are kind of another nuclear fiction classic but with a more mech-tastic twist because it kind of reminds me of Canical for Leibowitz and Earth Abides. And I'm sure there are others where a reaction to nuclear apocalypse, quasi-apocalypse, was people freaking out about technology. Is this a, a movie or a book or something? or what is? Canical for Leibowitz and Earth Abides are both novels. Um, hmm. Actually, Earth Abides is by uh, Leah Brackett, who co-wrote The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, okay. I didn't know that. Uh, both I would recommend checking out. But there's often, you know, versions of technology is bad and hmm. it that's what gave us this world and the brotherhood of steel does a more sort of we can handle it but you can't because you you know you peons uh <laughs> blow us up again i guess so that's another detail that the more nuclear fiction you peruse the more you see that there are these similar themes fallout is basically if you take every single nuclear culture movie book story and you put it into a blender and it comes out great <laughs> that that's really that the way true. it works they're also you you find the, the tiniest little references to things mm-hmm. sometimes it's something obvious like the fact that you have a dog and you're running around the wasteland that's clearly like a boy and his dog or you get this those little side story there'll be a tiny little detail you go oh wow that's that's a reference to on the beach or something like that and it just or the house in fallout 3 with the uh the ray bradbury there will come soft rains mm-hmm. with the robot. <laughs> it's so upsetting. It's so good. <laughs> it's it's fun just to pick out all the different things there. You don't have to really actually play the game if you want to. You can just wander around looking for the next pop culture reference. That's true, but it's better to play. So one of the other groups that you work with, we've been teasing a little bit. It's called the Enclave, which is a 
secret organization made up of scientists, political people, military leaders from the pre-war U.S. government. They want to take over your dad's project. They want to use it because they want to use it as a, a way to control the wasteland. And they worked with vault Tech back in the day. They're like the deep state of the Fallout universe, as at Sam Davaham put it on Twitter when we were having a conversation about this upcoming episode. It's a shadow government carved out from the pre-war leadership. Like I said, they predicted nuclear war was going to happen, and they said that it was the only way to survive the nuclear war was to get the best people, like the most brilliant or effective individuals, put them in a bunker, and they will rebuild afterwards. They don't let outsiders come in. They don't intermix with them. And it's fun because you can decide whether or not you think that's a good way of approaching the apocalypse or you can take them out. You can kind of pick and choose. Take them out, I say. You say take them out? Kill the enclave. <laughs> well, one of the, th the conclusions that came out of that 1960s symposium I talked about earlier was that the only way to survive in a post-nuclear world is to have the creation of something like the enclave. Here's the quote that I have here. I think this is kind of fun. The rapidity of change and the fluid nature of social conditions in a post-attack emergency phase places a heavy premium on the elimination of bureaucratic structures and ideologies that are incompatible with speed and flexibility of operation. This disjunction presupposes the development of a, an, or utilization of highly organized federal defense force able to engage in direct reconnaissance and speedy information gathering and evaluation. It must have the capacity for rapidity of decision making as well as having the sanction and, and capability of direct mobilization, flexible operation, and meeting the imperative survival needs of throughout the nation. So that long thing basically I interpret as we need to have the enclave because they, they can get stuff done. <laughs> They can cut, cut through the red tape. That's but concerning. The Enclave is based at a place in the game called Raven Rock. They place it somewhere close by D.C. And this is a real-life Defense Department nuclear fallout bunker complex in southern Pennsylvania called Raven Rock Mountain Complex. This is like one of my favorite little references to real life and, and fallout. So this is a place, a book recently was released called Raven Rock, uh, which I recommend everybody to, to check out. I think I recommended it on the previous episode but I'll put it in our show notes here. It's the plan for continuity of government in this in the event of a nuclear attack. I think the book is called Raven Rock, The Government's Secret Plan to Survive Nuclear War and Not You. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Pretty much. I mean to read that too. A job posting for, on the Raven Rock website says, this is, it's a, this is how they describe their mission. The Raven Rock Mountain Complex is a unique, hardened, survivable, deep underground command center and relocation site with rigorous redundancy reliability and security standards charged with a mission to support the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, select DOD components as appropriate non-DOD agencies of the federal government to enable the execution of DOD mission essential functions in support of national defense. Um, mm -hmm. I love how they, they, they <laughs> put, if necessary, the non-DOD non agencies, which basically means the president, because that's really where the president would go mm -hmm. um, in the event of that. President Truman ordered its construction in 1950, thought it was a good idea. The entire site, not just the underground bunker, but every, the entire complex is over 600,000 square feet of facilities. It has Basically, it's like the Pentagon. It has its own living quarters, fitness centers, uh, medical facilities, dining halls, a barbershop, a chapel, legal services, and a convenience store. It's got everything all in one package. It could hold up to 3,000 people and operate for 30 days closed off entirely from the outside world. It has a bunch of other alternate nicknames. The Alternate National Military Command Center, Site R, Underground Pentagon, Backup <laughs> Pentagon, and The Rock. Ugh. So a lot of those. Uh, this the, the book I was mentioning earlier is by Garrett Graf, uh, and he's, he's a great journalist, and he's, this book is a lot of fun to, to check out. It's, it's in the game. The game loves to utilize real-life circumstances and just takes them to their illogical or logical conclusions. I'm not really <laughs> sure, but Fallout 3 ends with you, you... If you want to play the main story, I guess you basically make a decision at the end to uh, help out your father, uh, his mission, but you can end it in all kinds of different ways, right? You can sacrifice yourself to do what you need to do at the end. You can send somebody else in as a trick. You can you can pass the buck to someone that would be able to survive this radioactive room where you need to push a button or something like that. Or you can work with the Enclave, right? As one of the other ways. Uh, yeah. They, one of the things that if you have a, I'm not going to try not to give everything away, but um, 
one of your options is to basically start the process that would poison everybody. Basically, everyone mutated, I think. So that means all the ghouls and super mutants, uh, which sounds good, but, you know, you meet a few lovely ghouls. Uh, there's a ghoul town that I'm always very fond of. I didn't mention the ghouls are people that were affected by radiation, but it didn't kill them. It just right. made them, it, like, tears off their skin. They have, like, gravelly voices, and some of them <laughs> For have... Some reason. They all have the same voice. And other ones are feral, like they're maniacs that are trying to kill you. But the sad thing is, is if you kill one of them and you go to loot their bodies, usually there's like a bottle cap and a teddy bear. <laughs> or... oh, it's the worst! I love it! Oh my god! That's my favorite thing! It's so upsetting! Yeah. It's always like a one spoon or a teddy bear, as you say. It's so bad. I love it. Oh god. But there, there's some non-feral ones that are very, very pleasant people sure. that... You know, of course, sometimes trusting ghouls will also lead you astray, as you learn in Tenpenny Tower, uh, which is where the rich people hide out. <laughs> that was... I put the game down for a week after the... Well, they're the ones that are... I'm going to go to it in my game, because they're the ones that pay you to blow up Megatown. Right, exactly. Um, but it's... How many, how many caps do you get for blowing up Megaton? I've never done it, so... Is it enough to make it worthwhile? <laughs> it's enough to get you through the next couple of days, and... <laughs> You can buy your you can buy your jet and your uh, your whiskey for the next couple of days. Well, that seems disproportionate. Still, I don't know. Apparently, uh, in Japan, um, the version of Fallout Three, they made two edits, and one of them is you don't see the mushroom cloud. I believe you can still choose to blow up Megaton, but they edit out the mushroom cloud for obvious reasons. And also, as I, the weapon, uh, the Fat Man, oh, where yeah. you can launch the mini nuke. They changed the name because. I mean, obviously. Uh, yeah, a little, a little inappropriate there. Yeah. <laughs> so that's Fallout 3. I like it a lot, but some people really like Fallout New Vegas more. It was the same publisher, but a different group designed it, uh, or actually made it. I think it was Obsidian Entertainment made the game itself. And this takes place in the Las Vegas area. So it's called the Mojave Wasteland. Uh, you play a character named The Courier. However you want to play it, however you want your character to look, and it takes place in 2281, about four years after Fallout 3 ended. But they're unrelated stories, pretty much. You know, you, you see references to Fallout 3. You may see ideas of where this, what was happening in the West in Fallout 3, but they're pretty much unrelated. There's notable locations like we have in all the other ones. There's the Hoover Dam. You can go there. Uh, there's the Vegas Strip, which is very fun to go up and down and see what it'll be like in this post-apocalypse world. There's also one of my favorite things is there's this large heliostat solar power station. The, mm -hmm. the tower systems that use mirrors to produce more concentrated solar power. I love that because I was recently driving, because I'm originally from California, and when I'm home, friends and I will go to Las Vegas. And you're driving, and on the left side, there's this gigantic heliostat solar power system. And I, and I go, oh, man. And I go, fall out. <laughs> I think I was mentioning to the person that was driving, I'm like, yeah, I was up there before. Um, <laughs> but that's a little fun thing. Fallout New Vegas. I've been replaying New Vegas, and I spent a little more time in New Vegas because, I don't know, you could spend a bazillion hours in each, but New Vegas is arguably even more uh, open world sort of than, than three. Cause there's just, there's so many things to do. I mean, even with the ending, there's um, a bunch of different options. It's a lot less different. bleak. Yes, it is. Vegas wasn't hit by a direct attack. If I remember this right, there's a guy named Robert house who was like a casino mogul. He was a smart guy. I guess he predicted there was going to be a nuclear war. And I love the fact his name is Robert house. Cause you know, he's the house, the house always wins. <laughs> so he created missile defense using lasers at all of his casinos to shoot down incoming attacks. And he also did this thing where I thought was, I didn't know, I played the game, I, I, I didn't pick this up, but he found a way to brute force disarm the incoming Chinese warheads. So wow. I guess as they're incoming, he would shut them off so they would just land like duds. Um, I didn't pick that up when I was playing it, but... No, me neither. Uh, that's what the, the internet tells me, so I believe it. <laughs> now that I saw that, I was annoyed by that because... This has always been a concern with people who design nuclear weapons and had a plan for using them, having them hacked and having the missiles get disarmed or diverted. Because you always see, you see in a lot of movies, there's like an abort button. Um, right. So the second or third episode we did on a podcast was Mission Impossible 4 had that scene at the end where Tom Cruise hits a button to, to disarm a nuclear bomb. It's always one of my things is people that watch movies like that need to realize 
when a nuclear missile is launched, it cannot be recalled. It has no way of being shot down unless it's, there's some kind of missile defense. There's no abort button because they were always worried that someone would hack into that abort button switch and shut it off. But I guess in this in this fallout world, they had an ability to self-destruct it or receive some kind of signals. Because when a missile goes up, it doesn't receive any more signals. It puts out signals saying where it is to the people that are planning it, but there is no re- incoming receipt of information. But that's how we have a game in Vegas, and nothing happened, essentially. Your character is delivering a really important item, uh, which some sort of poker chip that they call, what is it, it's like a platinum chip. It, mm-hmm. It's a high-intensity storage, high-capacity storage device that would allow Mr. House, who, of course, it's Fallout, so it has to be weird, took his brain <laughs> and put it into a computer because he realized that he wanted to, to live to see what world would it be like after nuclear war. So he put his informa- he took his brain, put it into a computer, and the poker chip would allow him to constantly update, and he controls all these... What are they called? Automatrons? Like, uh, Securitrons? Securitrons? I might be adding a few extra vowels, but that's the uh, gist of it. They're these little robot things that wander around the wasteland, at the Mojave wasteland, and, and enforce order. You get attacked. Gang essentially steals your poker chip and leaves you for dead. You come back and decide to, however you want to approach it, you can either join up with this group called the Legion, which is Caesar's, <coughs> Caesar's Palace extras, that have taken over part of the land. They all dress like people from ancient Rome and you can decide to work with them. You could decide to work with the new California Republic from the earlier games, which is like a national guard unit. They have a flag with two headed bear on it. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to convince my wife to let me buy that flag and put it on our wall. Yes. I'm not making any progress <laughs> on that. Or you, can work, or you can work with Mr. House and decide to either t- take over him or work with him and all that kind of fun stuff. Or you can do the No Gods, No Masters ending, which is literally called that. That's how overt the anarchist uh, <laughs> messaging is. And in that case, you can work with a weird robot called Yes Man, and you can figure out sort of which of the other sort of lesser clans, and and you can sort of take over yourself in that way with Yes Man's help. And there's also a group called the Followers of the Apocalypse, which are sort of like a like a mutual aid, vaguely anarchist sort of group. Mm. So I, I always dig them, even though they're not like the most flashy um, or obviously evil group. Mm-hmm. So on my first playthrough, I stuck with the NCR for a lot of it, picked off many Legion troops because they have a lot of good loot that you can uh, <laughs> pick up and sell to this one robot. Um, eventually I did No Gods, no Masters and I took over myself, uh, betraying oh. the NCR at the end through the magic of a very high speech check. So that was fun. Well done. <laughs> you carved out your own world and power there. I did. And I think that's why people like Fallout New Vegas quite a lot. Definitely. You, you can decide how to do whatever whatever you want to end it with. You can do that. Playing as a libertarian, I will say that it starts to feel like you have you have a, a choice between the U.S. government, which is basically the NCR in this case, basically ISIS in the form of the Legion, mm-hmm. um, sort of right-wing crazies in the Brotherhood of Steel, Let's say some street gangs, various factions, or, you know, how, Mr. House ending, that's sort of hard to put into the real world. Um, or you can choose the anarchist uh, ending. Well, Mr., Mr., Mr. House is like a businessman. Right, that's true. It, so it's, that's... It's, it's another example of what it would be like if businessmen ran the government. Hey, it's, he's doing better than the Legion, that's for sure, but that's not saying much. There's a lot of Legion apologism if you go to, to the, the subreddits. Um, <laughs> There was actually supposed to be a lot more Legion content. I think Obsidian was told to finish the game super quickly. Mm. So it's, maybe they were going to add a little more nuance because those guys are pretty... I mean, they go around crucifying people. Um, yeah. They're, like, intensely sexist for good measure. I usually play as a lady. Um, they're sort of exhaustingly evil in some ways. And just to see how the game goes in my new playthrough, I wanted to not immediately you know be mortal enemies with them but it's so hard not to because they're so evil yeah it takes a lot for them to trust you yeah and they're just so very evil with new vegas it took me a long time before i really decided to commit to sort of a faction and an allegiance you know i was in pretty good standing with a couple of groups but i didn't really want to end with the uh, ncr Mm because too libertarian for that um (laughs) And really, like, committing to, like, this group is now going to attack me on site. I have to fight them. It's strangely difficult, which is kind of a fun 
thought experiment where you really like I have to I have to take the plunge and, and just the fact that your loyalties can switch in this fictional world is it feels interesting it feels sort of stressful but in a fun way having to pick new alliances and and world orders it makes a lot of sense why Fallout 4 chose Boston as their location because it's the birthplace of the revolution or and you essentially are playing out again trying to carve a new world in Boston. As you mentioned earlier, you're someone called the sole survivor. And the reason is, is because you and your family, and you can pick to either be, you know, it's a family unit, like traditional nuclear family. You have a mother and a father and a, and a recently, recently born baby. You're one of the fancy people that get to be in a fallout shelter. And you go in this shelter when the war starts to happen. And 210 years later, you're, you come out of it. But you find out that at some point while you were frozen, you find out that your child had been stolen and your significant other were killed. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you're looking for your child somewhere in the Commonwealth wasteland. And again, notable locations include things like Diamond City, which is fun. It's on top of Fenway Park. That's one of the major cities in the town. I was, I was pretty excited when I saw that, uh, the Red Sox <laughs> Stadium. Bunker Hill has been repurposed uh, as a location of this one group that's there. There's the Boston Commons, uh, which is a lot of fun to, to wander around in there. There's USS Constitution. And even the bar from Cheers makes an appearance. Really? Yeah. I so don't think I realized that. You may not have gotten there yet, but it's one of those little hidden locations. <laughs> and you wander around, and, and I'm not going to ruin it for you because you're still playing it. Um, <laughs> I have my suspicions about certain things, but I'm not even going to read your little plot outline because... Oops. Ah. I know I, I I have a suspicion, but I don't know enough of the specifics. I don't know how I went on Reddit this long and didn't get horribly spoiled, but I didn't, and I'm going to try to keep it that way for well, now. I would, I would say the big twist at the end, I guess what you would think is a twist, it, you probably have already figured it out. I think I have, but don't tell me. I won't tell you. Don't tell me. But I will say there's different groups that you can work with here, so don't look at the, the notes here. Uh, okay. there's, there's a group called the the Institute, which is this very mysterious group that you don't you hear about all the time, but you don't know what's going on. They're essentially creating these things called synths, these synthetic mm. artificial intelligence machines. And they're, re they're kidnapping people and replacing them with synths. And their whole idea is this is the next wave of human evolution, kind of similar to the mutants and the FEV. This is the new way to survive because humanity has had its chance. It's screwed up. Now we're going to survive. You can decide to work with them or you can work against them. There's the Brotherhood of Steel. They're back. They're here to destroy the Institute because... They're the only ones that get to have technology. As usual. Yeah, they don't like synths so much. Then there's the group called The Railroad, which is people, it's an underground group trying to save synths, because not all synths are bad. Some people want their freedom. So they're trying to get them. And then there's this group, which I always found really irritating, the Minutemen. The yeah, Minutemen. we all find them annoying. <laughs> and you're essentially forced, the only problem with this is you're forced <laughs> to work with them. And they're super irritating. But there are people that are wandering around trying to save people and they fight off raiders and they will help people, uh, which sounds great, but I don't want to have to work with them. Um, <laughs> and that's, you pick and choose how you want to work with these various groups. But again, the unique thing about this Fallout game is you're someone who had survived before the war, and then it really doesn't matter as much later on, but then you are get introduced 200 years afterwards, and you have to try to maneuver around. And the only other thing I want to mention about this game is that have you, have you made it to the glowing sea yet? No, I, j I found the way to get there, I think, but I basically I don't have enough um, inventory to feel like I should make the trip yet. I, Survive, I, I yeah. think I'll, I'll die of radiation poisoning real fast. I don't have enough ammo. I just need to stock up. <laughs> so, so the glowing sea for people that are listening, it's the ground zero for the biggest bomb that must have hit the Boston area. It's the first one you see in the opening uh, scenes in the game. It's still super radioactive 200 years afterwards to the point where if you wander into it, the entire atmosphere of the game changes. It's just constant blackness and radioactive storms, and you're always being affected by radiation. There's these giant scorpion monsters that are trying <laughs> to get you, and it's just a wild place to, to be at. But it's, as I'll discuss a little bit later on, it plays around fast and loose with radiation. The Fallout games, you don't know what <laughs> kind of bombs they made. They must have made something that has longer-lasting radiation. Or... One of the things I'm just going to have to let the game have is that it is not what... Our world today would think of radiation and how it works. It's what people in the 1940s and 50s must have thought radiation was and the right. kind of problems that it would create if this erupted. It would cause mutations. It would cause arms to grow out of your stomach or it would turn you <laughs> into a ghoul or it would be radiation that would be around for 200 years. 
So I think thematically it makes sense, but the glowing sea is the perfect place <laughs> to just wander around in. in. In game, there's a little meter that pops up if you're near something radioactive, and it clicks like a Geiger counter, and it'll say, you know, one rad, two rad, three rad, 50 rad. And if you get up to 1,000, you just die. Yeah. But if you get after a certain point, your body starts to degrade. Everything's dizzy. Um, your aim is off, like a sliding scale of radiation. But if you walk in the glowing sea without any sort of protection, <laughs> you, you get you get down pretty quick. I don't know my radiation science very well, but I, I, I'm always assuming that none of this has anything to do with reality. Again, more of the retro, uh, the retro future stuff. It, it, that includes just like a complete lack of scientific accuracy. Mm-hmm. The fact that water is particularly radioactive, I'm pretty sure that doesn't make sense based on the fact that water is such a good shield for like a uh, for reactors and stuff. I was going to say that four people are really critical of four because they made some possibly ill-advised changes, including um, the dialogue is sort of not as complicated, and there's a speech protagonist which does sort of diminish the immersion factor. And there's also the fact that they built this, this whole, you can build settlements and help out people, which is kind of fun, except it becomes this burden. Yeah. And when, you know, when, when the plot is such a, like, I have to save my, my child, like, that's the motivation. It's particularly silly that you would sit around building settlements. Even right. in, like, three, where you're sort of confused and your dad's gone and you're kind of young, you could be like, all right, I have to make my own way. I'll build these settlements. But if your goddamn baby's missing... Like, you're going to immediately grab your baby and, like, not really prioritize anything else. Why would you do a, any, any side mission? But the opener where you have to run to the vault and the nukes are coming is so right. unsettling. That's kind of the the moment of, like, just, like, mm-hmm. pure, like the maximum horror. And it does it very well for, for sort of still very not uh, realistic humans. And it's just, like, it... It feels so much more serious than just a silly old video game. In Fallout 3, you can meet a ghoul who was a human when the war happened. Um, and she can, she tells you about it. And it's, you know, it's as grim as anything in um, On the Beach or something. It's, it's a sort of sillier setting where this is basically a zombie type creature telling you this. The emotions and like the fears and the nightmare, the, the nightmare of the human race thing, it, it translates even to this kitschy, setting and i think that's almost one of the game's best story accomplishments even if it's sort of genre whiplash sometimes and and sort of odd i think it works much better than it has any right to i I definitely see that when i was recently playing fallout 3 you wander around in the wasteland and you come across this house that clearly it's it's been it's burnt out there's not much basically but that a frame of the house left and you go in inside one of the rooms and there's a bathtub with a skeleton in it, and you can see that the skeleton threw in a uh, toaster mm-hmm. inside the game. So you see, you see, like, this person knew something was happening and decided they made a choice. This is how it was going to happen. Or you run in, you wander into a room and you see a bunch of teddy bears in an area. Yeah. You create a story, a child that was left by themselves, and they stole a bunch of teddy bears from a place. And then you, want, you turn the corner and you go, oh, there's a kid's skeleton. That sucks. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah, to think of it that way. Um, so there's always these little stories that you get a little hint of, and then you come up with your own thing on top of it. There's so many. It's, again, it's like nightmare Easter eggs. Yep. Some people might not be as bothered by it because they might not be as historically savvy as as we are, shall I say, okay. or have you know experienced as much fiction about it or thought that hard about it. But it's hard to deny that it's just it's very humorous, very grim world the, the only other weird random thing i like about fallout that i'll mention here is hardcore mode which is yeah. i've never done it but i like the idea of it which is it's a difficulty setting i think it's only is it in fallout new vegas and then four i don't think it's yeah. in three and you can set it so that usually in the game your health you use a, a something called a sim pack and it brings your health back instantly or if you hurt your leg you can use a, a basically like a first aid kit to yeah. help you out. Radiation, you can drop your radiation. You do all these things and you survive and there's lots of ammunition and, and you can you can play the game and it'll be fun. But hardcore mode means that you can use your health pack but it takes a long time for your health to come back. There's a limited number of health packs around the world. You just can't go around buying them. Ammunition is really hard. Uh, you easily can die in the event of some kind of encounter. 
So basically, it's like, all right, you like playing the game. It's fun. Now, what would you do if it was for real? <laughs> like, it removes as much as you can the kind of video gameness of it. I like the fact that that exists. I do too. I, I played all of New Vegas the first time, and actually this time as well on hardcore. And I don't think it takes as much commitment. I wonder that, that there was never really a a storyline in Fallout where you try to redeem the Raiders a little bit. No, yeah, not that I know of. I always wanted something like that because <laughs> I'm a big fan of A Song of Ice and Fire, and uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the storylines are about even people who are these these outlaws, these criminals, these broken men. You don't have to agree with what they do, but you understand where they came from. They were people at one point, and then they were turned into this. I think that idea, Fallout, does for other people, but the Raiders never get that. You're right. It's always, Raiders are probably, now they're named gangs in some of them, like New Vegas, something like the Cons, who were kind of not nice, but there's definitely more sympathy for them. But just like the plain Raiders and like the least sympathetic, sort of least nuanced villains of all. I haven't gotten close enough to the Legion to sort of get have them explain themselves, but I know that there's dialogue where if you talk to Caesar and like his second in command guy, like they'll try to explain how, you know, why they're being as bad as they are. And you even encounter characters who say, well, you know, that they got rid of all the raiders and it's actually uh, the roads in their territory is Mm -hmm. safer. And again, as libertarian, I'm like, well, still no, but like they're hat, they give them a reason. Raiders, they're always like, well, they're all on drugs. Yeah. And that's all. I'm like, all right, but you know, you can, you can draw them out a little more. Yeah, the, the, I don't know what our drug policy would be with dealing with raiders. It's, it's lock, <laughs> lock them up and hit them with a mini nuke. I think in the Nuka World expansion in 4, I I don't know if you become a raider or something, but I don't know if there, maybe that's the nuance we're looking for. Um, I might have to find out. Yeah, I, I haven't played that one, so maybe that might be something yeah, to check there. out. I think it's time to get a little super critical about some of the nuclear elements <laughs> here. Um, so please feel free to interrupt me at any point of these because uh, I have a couple of things. That, but I think it'd be fun to talk about, especially for someone like yourself who is well-versed in the apocalyptic culture, pop culture side of that. But maybe, you know, you didn't get your MA in, in nuke stuff. I sure didn't. <laughs> well done for you on that point. Good, good decision. Uh, but these, <laughs> so some of my biggest qualms about Fallout has always been the balance that it tries to strike between the devastation of a nuclear war and the world that would be left behind and the one that we get, which is the one you get to play around in. And I get it. It can't be completely realistic. No one wants to play the road, the video game, where it's just (laughs) constant bleakness and there's no way to survive. Like that idea is not really something you could do, but it's still, it's annoying to me because they try in other areas to be super realistic. And the other idea is, is that I'm always have a trouble with is, is the premise of the the start of the war. Uh, it's never really clear to me, you know, why the United States and China would start this war. They say it's kind of about oil and it's about survival, but I never really understood the purpose behind it. And again, maybe that's thematic, that there wasn't really a reason. It, would, it just happened. Or the United States was getting too close into China's territory, so it decided to, to do what it needed to do because it was the only thing it could do to survive. The idea that that it would take out America so they can get at Alaska in Mexican oil. And I never really understood what's the next step there. Like what's the <laughs> next plan? I don't know. Maybe it was an accident, but there's even a storyline of the game where it may have been caused by aliens. Cause of course it's fallout. Cause there's aliens there. There's all these weird stuff in the fallout games. And, or maybe it was even a plan by vault tech to sell more vaults, like to get more <laughs> defense contract, let's start a war. But I do enjoy the fact that it's not just another U S versus the Soviet union yeah, it's either usually act of like specifically the Soviet Union or it's the unnamed enemy uh, right. in, in nuclear fiction. It's not usually uh, another country entirely. So that is a little bit fresh. The Red Dawn, that remake in 20, <laughs> whatever it was, 2012, uh, was so supposed to be. Bad. It's ter- so bad. It's terrible. It's <laughs> terrible. But that movie was supposed to be China and then in post production right. they changed it. I was, when, I was when, I, when that movie came out, I was like, wow, that'd be a really interesting take. What would it look like? And then they just switched it to North Korea, which maybe people might think that's more realistic today. I still would say no, but it's at least something different. But it was such an odd choice. Anyways, I I at least appreciate that. Such a bland movie. Such a bland movie. Awful. But I think there's a couple other things that I think are worth talking about here. Largely, the biggest one is how it portrays nuclear weapons and radiation. Because I think a lot of people recognize that the game isn't real. But the number of times I've read or have talked to people that say, 
that think that the fallout interpretation of radiation and war and all of these things is real ast- uh, astounds me. It's just, <laughs> you read the Reddit threads and how people come across this stuff. I read one recently was like, oh, isn't it crazy? You know, today I learned that radiation is exactly the same as it is in Fallout because <laughs> because rads are a thing. The first thing I have a, to talk about is radiation as, as a gameplay mechanic. It, it's interesting because it uses uh, radiation not just as a, it kills you or you're alive, but it's this spectrum of how it affects your health and mm-hmm. your ability to fire weapons and all that. But the game sometimes goes overboard. So radiation in the game is measured by the number of rads, which is a real unit of measurement in radiation. It's an outdated one, even back then. In the 60s and the 50s, it was an outdated concept. In the game, a thousand rads will kill you if you get a lot of them in a short amount of time, which is about the same that it would in real life in terms of radiation doses. So it's a nice round number. So that's kind of fun. But the game doesn't really break down different types of radiation. It just says radiation. Uh, Radiation is, there's gamma radiation. That's not so good. Neutron radiation, really, really bad. But then there's stuff like beta and alpha particles that are the most abundant things and fallout, um, but you can deal with them. You, if you have uh, alpha particles are blocked by your skin, dead skin cells, but it's, it's dangerous if you consume them. Say they're on a, uh, you breathe them in, you eat something on the food, uh, that's not so good. Beta particles are blocked by things like your clothing or you know the dirt or some other stuff like that, but it's, again, there's these different types of radiation, but they just all lump them together in the game, and that's okay. I don't really want to play a science radiation <laughs> game. I yes, can, you do, though. Don't you, don't you want to also a little bit? Uh, you know, like a DLC content would be great. Maybe that's a mod. <laughs> a mod where you have to deal with different types of radiation. But one of the things that uh, the Fallout does is the idea that radiation is so long-lasting that even yeah. 200 years, you have to deal with it. And again, I'm going to caveat this with maybe this is different types of radiation in the game. Maybe they say it all happened all at once, so something we didn't expect happened. But... Usually, people consider two weeks to be the safe amount of time for most fallout-affected areas. That's how long you need to be. So you're in your bunker for two weeks, maybe give it a couple days to have some margins on the end, and then you can leave and start to rebuild. That's different if you're near ground zero, if you're near a place where a bomb hit, say, on the actual like a ground burst, not a bomb that goes up up on the air, but on the one that hits the ground. That could be a, a problem, but it's something that you don't have to deal with 200 years after the fact. One of the best examples of this is the Nevada test site, which is now called the National Security Site. You can go on a tour there. It's still radioactive 72 years after the first nuclear bomb test, the Trinity test. But if you're there for an hour, that dose that you would receive is about half of the amount you would receive on the average day from natural or background sources of radiation because we're always constantly being affected by radiation if you're in a building that has concrete in it you're being affected by radiation you eat a banana banana potassium (laughs) has some form of spontaneous radiation and it's hitting you at all points it's just a question of whether or not what's the dosage like so the idea that these things would be around 200 years after the fact it's fun it's good thematically but hopefully people don't think that this is the way it will be and i'm not trying to to downgrade the threat of radiation or nuclear weapons it's just like that's a problem but it's really bad immediately. But after eventually amount of time, there's something you can deal with it. It's, the problem is, is that it's so terrible in that short amount of time that the world that you have afterwards looks it's awful. But it's not because of radiation. It's because of other issues that have happened with the people that are, that have been affected by it. We talked a little bit about radioactive water. That's not yeah. re- that's not really a thing, uh, <laughs> especially a hundred years. Now there is some stuff. So cesium one thirty seven is a fallout isotope that comes out of, of most nuclear bombs it's water soluble so it will get into the water and stay there um, okay but it's only really a problem immediately after the war and has a short half-life and you don't have to worry about it too much but it's certainly something that people would be concerned about the bigger problem would be where there's a river and there's runoff that if gets mixed with radioactive material in the dirt that's kind of a problem but again the idea that you couldn't filter that stuff out it's <laughs> So this whole water purification system thing would just be a water filtration system, <laughs> and you should be okay. But it's, again, a fascinating way of having a game mechanic. I mean, I guess in 3, the infrastructure is somehow so bad and has not recovered in two centuries because yeah. of all the super mutants, maybe, I don't know, um, that maybe it is a kind of basic 
water filtration system, but it's still a big deal for the people of this area because things are that miserable. That's my... Uh, they haven't picked up that pile of dirt over there and the rubble. <laughs> I know, everyone says that. What, nuclear war prevents you from tidying up? Come on. But I, <laughs> there, you, again, if you want to keep creating excuses, you could say thematically it's because people don't feel the need to do that. This is a new world. It's what's the point? Yeah. If you clean up, there's just going to be another dust storm that's going to come up and destroy everything. It's another the, super mutant will come and knock your house down. Why jerks, bother? Such jerks. There's also things like radiation storms in Fallout 4, which is a great grain play mechanic, but not really a thing because I don't even know what that would look like. Yeah. There's other, um, there's the sort of crappy, but sort of enthralling, um, teen show, The 100, mm -hmm. which my boyfriend and I have been watching. Um, and there is something with radiation storms and that that is never, they don't even bother to try to explain what the hell it's supposed to be. And that's actually another thing that sort of puts a bunch of genres and versions of like apocalypses and just like, puts them in a blender with some sort of annoying teens. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, the best thing I've ever watched by any means, but it, it sort of pulls it off in some ways, but. If you want, you know, this is just how it would be. That's not, it's not the show for you. and This is not the game for you, probably. It's honestly, it's on our list of things to watch, but I only have a little bit of bandwidth when it comes to convincing the wife to watch nuclear <laughs> things. I get, I get one a month, maybe. Yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> I, I spent a lot of it on Battlestar Galactica. So there's two things, two little medicines, items that you can use in the game that affect radiation, right? There's Rataway, which... <laughs> It's a great name for something that would take radiation that you're affected by and flush it out of your system. It's some kind of chemical liquid that you put into your veins and it will remove radiation either by flushing it out of your urine or removing radiated blood. I can't really tell, but it's, <laughs> if it's urine, it's kind of gross because you're imagining you use a rat away and you're just peeing wherever you're currently standing. You gotta do what you gotta do. If you want to make survive. it. The game takes place in 2077. Right? At least that's when the war happens. Mm -hmm. So maybe we've advanced our science to that certain point by then. But there is real-life equivalence of this stuff where you have some sort of, sort of radioactivity inside your body, but it's usually very low amounts. And it's the same thing. You Chemicals that will attract radiation, uh, radioactive particles in your body, and will attach, and then they get flushed out of your system through many different ways. So there is that there, but it doesn't affect your body when it comes to like DNA damage. Like if, right. <laughs> if someone shoots you with radiation, your cells have started to change to a point where they're not, they break down. Rad X is the other chemical that's in the game. And this is a fun one. So this prevents radiation problems from developing in the first place. So a lot of people compare this stuff to re the real life um, potassium iodine tablets. Remember after Fukushima, there was a run on potassium iodine in California to the point where it was really expensive. And the people who actually need it, which are elderly and children, need this type of material or need these pills they couldn't get it because everybody was just buying buying it up for people that, that don't know how iodine tablets work what they do is they clog up your thyroid so that it can't absorb any sort of radioactive material particularly uh, iodine which is a byproduct of, of radiation it keeps them from coalescing around your thyroid and then causing oh. radioactive problems so when oh. you if you were to drink ra irradiated milk say a cow eats irradiated grass and it you know makes irradiated milk and you give that to your child it would then be collected in the milk into your into your child's thyroid and it would cause thyroid problems this just flushes it out so it never lets it collect anywhere in your body i did not i knew about the thyroid i don't have a thyroid somebody uh surgeon sliced it right out Popped but up. i didn't realize that uh <laughs> that it sort of prevents it that makes sense though i like learning stuff so i'm excited right now but go on <laughs> so it's great if that's one of the problems that you have to worry about, but it doesn't do anything for all the other types of radiation and right. radioactive fallout. It only prevents that one particular thing, right. which is, again, would be the worry if you were worried about radiation coming over from, from somewhere in Japan hitting the West Coast of the United States. But isn't, if you take all the, the iodine tablets in the world and someone zaps you with radioactive <laughs> gamma rays, it doesn't do much not, for Yeah, not going to work, huh? But there is something cutting edge right now that the Defense Department... Uh, and DARPA is working on, and it's called, I don't know if they're trying to do some sort of homage to Fallout's Rad X pill, but there's something called X-Rad. Oh, man. <laughs> it's it's recently been developed uh, through, the, like I said, the Department of Defense, 
and another fallout sounding company called Anoko Nova Therapeutics. <laughs> That's, yeah. So this helps to reduce the amount of uh, damage that radiation can do to your DNA on a cellular level. And it's been shown in lab settings to help mice when they've been zapped with radioactive uh, gamma radiation in clinical studies. So they're thinking this would be something that could help at, deal with that particular problem. Probably not if you receive what's called um, burst gamma radiation, like instant, the bomb goes off and there's all these neutrons that get fired. Not much you can do about that. You're probably going to not make it. But if this is the longer lasting uh, gamma radiation, if you were in the battlefield and you would take a bunch of these pills before you went in there, it would cause your cells to not break down. That's kind of interesting. Uh, the game didn't use that as a, a source of inspiration because it wasn't there yet, but life's imitating Fallout art in that particular way. One other last thing of radiation I think would be cool to talk about is in the game, there's a lot of these groups, these cults of radiation that get formed. So I love, this is one of my favorite aspects of Fallout 3 and 4, the Children of Adam. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Uh, it's a really interesting little cult there. They believe that radiation is this gift sent by God to humanity. And they believe, um, I think I remember this, that every atom is a representation of the universe. And when you split the atom, you create two universes. So we're seeing God's creation happening. So atomic bombs are awesome because they create all <laughs> these new universes. And we should be embracing radiation. So they live out in the glowing sea in Fallout 4 at some point when you get there. Sorry, oh, I ruined it. But they're <laughs> no, out there. It's okay. <laughs> and it's kind of a fun little thing. And, and Megaton, uh, in that city in Fallout 3, they're sitting there worshiping the bomb. <laughs> and it reminds me of, I can't shut that part of my brain off. It makes me think about the real world uh, while playing these games. There, there was a time in the early 1900s in the United States where radiation-laced products were all the rage. People yeah. loved having these things because they were sold like snake oil with promises of tremendous benefits for the people who consumed them. There were things like wear radium pendants to, to fight off your joint pains, wear uranium blankets, and they'll help with your arthritis. Oh no. If you take thorium laced medicine, you can help fight off your indigestion problem. <laughs> uh, you can fight off your irritable bowel syndrome with some thorium. Because it was so popular, the other problem that developed was there were companies who would create fraudulent products that actually didn't have the amount of radioactive material in them, not even the levels that they promised. So this industry got created. So one of the first things that the U.S. government, when they created the FDA, was to regulate companies that had fraudulent amounts of radiation in those products and not to fight the fact that they were products laced with radiation. They were just making go out, going after the ones that were falsely advertising <laughs> Uh, the amount there. So one of the stories that I'll link to in our show notes is an article from Popular Science Magazine. And it talked about a real life equivalent of something in the game called Nuka-Cola, which is this very popular soda brand in, in the video game series. One of the game's uh, versions of this is Nuka-Cola Quantum, which is like a really good soda, but it has a little bit of radiation in there that makes it glow blue. And you can you can have it and it gives your, makes your life a little bit better. In, in the real world, <laughs> Balium Radium Laboratories of New Jersey produced this particular product. They called it Certified Radioactive Water. And people were, were, the FDA said, you don't actually have the amount of radiation in there that you say you do. So you need to stop having these advertisements. Well, they said they would give $1,000 to anyone who could prove that this product didn't, didn't actually have the radiation. And it was called Radithor, was the soda, the brand soda. Well, it turned out that it did have the amount of radioactivity as advertised. And one of the people who died from it, this guy named Eben Byers, who was a well-known industry uh, type titan. He was a playboy. He would drink three bottles a day. He died what they called a gruesome death in 1932. And the Wall Street Journal ran a headline about the story. Um, about the, story. the radium water worked fine until his jaw came off. That is a great headline, speaking as a journalist, but oh, man. Yeah, get it, pull that one on for your next time you have to edit something. Uh. Um, this forced the FDA, because it was such a big story, to regulate radioactive health products uh, to make sure that they were both safe, effective, and as advertised. And <laughs> the radiation health industry collapsed, and it kind of went away. So that was a, a particularly interesting time in American history. And it, um, in some of the novels I mentioned before, I'm trying to remember the term in a canticle for Leibowitz where they refer to the 
um, the radiation that killed almost everybody. And they, they refer to it in these very biblical terms, and it's not like directly bowing before an ICBM type of thing. It's more like that was long ago. This mysterious thing came across the earth, um, and the 100 also does that a lot. There's um, sort of an instant religion built up in sort of strangely quickly um, around the nukes and this the robotics. There's a whole thing. But th that's also like a, clearly a favorite in fictional uh, nuclear tales. And it makes sense because I didn't realize the, the extent uh, that the children of Adam had put into their religion, like the thought they'd put into it. But, you know, that works. Why not? Uh, I mean, besides standing too close to the big bomb and megaton, probably not good for you. It's a religion that uh, needs constantly new followers. Yeah. What effect does radiation have on plant life and mutations of animals? Because in Fallout, radiation will kill plant life and makes bears turn into these gigantic creatures. <laughs> or it turns tiny little scorpions into these things that are the size of BW bugs that are trying to kill you. So one thing that people have looked into this, uh, Dr. Timothy Massau he was asked these questions about what Fallout, the game series, is it accurate for radiation? Because he's someone, <laughs> he studies, he's from the Department of Biology at the University of, of South Carolina. He, his research has shown in places like Chernobyl and around the Fukushima nuclear accident site that you can see that radiation has had a serious negative effect on, on plant life and wildlife. He saw that a lot of animal populations were teetering on the brink of uh, extinction and continue to suffer a lot of uh, birds, for example, constantly are almost right about to be extinct. And they weren't turned into radiation didn't help them evolve into giant birds. You know, <laughs> it didn't, it didn't. It just basically <laughs> some things will benefit from this. People always say cockroaches will benefit because they'll get to go around eating all the dead things and they have a higher tolerance for radiation than other things. Mice will die out instantly in an area because of the radiation, but the rats that didn't get hit by radiation, the ones on the outside, would now come into cities and areas that were affected, and they will thrive. So it's like radiation's good for some people, and it's not great for others, but it probably won't create rad scorpions and behemoth monsters and uh, death claws, all that kind of stuff in the game. Hopefully not. Now, there is the forced evolutionary virus. I don't know if that's sort of their... Their backup mm. explanation for the giant um, creatures. And obviously, to, to belabor the point, giant insects is very 1950s totally. movies. Godzilla, of course, um, is the is the first example of that. I don't know if that's the first, but the most famous example. But there's like them, which there's an homage to in Fallout 3, the one that pissed you off so much. Yeah, those. The, is the, the quest called Those, yep. <laughs> Where it, literally, it's just giant radioactive ants. Um, and that is a great movie in its ridiculousness. I think I, I'm willing to tolerate this aspect to it because it does such an interesting <laughs> homage to that previous stuff. So it works okay. Uh, two more here, and I appreciate your being on the podcast this long, uh, that are interesting to talk about. Uh, one question that was sent to us by a longtime listener uh, who goes by uh, at M2, MK2 Salamander on Twitter, he asked us what the feasibility of ghouls or giant insects would be. So right along these lines. Uh, <laughs> I don't really know how to answer this question because, you know, it, will, will radiation create giant monsters? Probably not. Um, but as you said, this is what nuclear war people thought would be like in the 1950s. And they thought giant monster ants and giant irradiated people monsters would be uh, certainly a thing. Uh, Dr. Masao, who I talked about earlier, he was asked this question about radiation. And he said instead of producing giant and powerful versions of, you know, rad scorpions and whatnot – Genetic damage that gets takes place by these animals that have been affected by Chernobyl, um, he sees a lot of problems and talks about birds in particular. Uh, they increase um, problems with their vision because their, their cataracts and their eyes get burned by the radiation and, and they go blind. That's not good for a bird. Uh, smaller brain sizes, reduced fertility, which is a thing with the super mutants in the game. They're all sterile, so they can't create new super mutants. But it's not great. He says... The big effect is going to be huge populations that are unhealthy and less fit, less able to deal with the changes in the environment, and less able to repopulate. So not really so, <laughs> the world that we see in Fallout. Although, in some ways, I guess we do. But that's like the least dramatic thing possible. Like, 
minor cell damage and like weak offspring if you have it at all instead of like being 50 feet tall i mean yeah um with with ghouls i mean to get really depressing they look you know they look like potentially a horribly burned i mean they're they're zombie-esque um and there's many a reddit uh debate and discussion about you know why some of the ghouls are like feral and sort of more classic zombies and some of them are basically totally normal people who look kind of messed up um but yeah i mean there's <laughs> i think that's mostly an homage to zombie stuff um hmm. i can't re- i can't really think of anything more classically nuclear fiction that the ghouls are um it also gives you a chance to either be tolerant or yeah. intolerant a lot of the time <laughs> Uh, one of the first choices you get when you get to Megatown is whether or not you are mean to a ghoul. And I think the choices are, he says, hey, what's up? And then your first choice is, ah, what are you? <laughs> um, I know, I was always like, oh, I'll be nice to you. That's one reason I would never blow up Megaton or side with the Enclave. It's like, just poor old Gob the ghoul, just w- working yeah. in the little bar in Megaton, just living his life. Like, what? <laughs> well, speaking of not letting people be, the last question we have here is also through Twitter. It's by a person I mentioned earlier, at Distant Wolf. He asked us to compare vault tech human experiments, though some of the ones we talked about when people are doing all these psychological experiments or radiation experiments, to real life human radiation experiments. That well, we're... that's a grim question. <laughs> it is. So I'm going to run through this quickly because one, we've been going long, and two, the more I linger on this, the the more scotch I need to be keep drinking here. Indeed. In 1994, President Bill Clinton and the Secretary of Energy launched what they called the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. This released 1.6 million pages of previously classified records detailing how from 1944 to 1974, the federal government sponsored several thousand human radiation experiments to test the effects of radiation on our bodies, to figure out how we would metabolize radioactive materials so that defense, uh, the Defense Department could plan for how to fight a nuclear war and civil defense offices can plan how to prevent people from being harmed to the, the most maximum degree. It was commonplace in the 1940s and the 50s for patients who went to hospitals for non-radiation ailments to be secretly injected with plutonium and other radiological materials without their awareness or consent. Oi. Uh, oi, indeed. Many patients, as you would imagine, suffered life-threatening conditions. Uh, outside of hospitals, the general public was also an unwitting test subject. Orphans were given irradiated milk to see what the effects would be. Kids were injected with non-therapeutic radioactive materials and amounts that would be uh, considered way too unsafe today uh, for a risk of thyroid cancers and other types of ailments. Prisoners, given the populations that are very vulnerable to these types of things, they were used as, as experiments. And also international releases of radioactive material to test to see what the environment would do. They had always said safe amounts. They would just try to do basically tracer amounts as when your body has radiation put into it, radioactive isotopes to see, to target medicine or to see how your body would react to these things. They said that that was just observational, but no, they didn't tell the public about it. It was pretty scary stuff. Uh, And finally, there was observational data that was collected from either people who worked uh, as part of the U.S. government's efforts for nuclear testing to see what their effects were now that they had worked there for such a long time, or people that lived on the Marshall Islands where we did all this nuclear testing, people developed incredibly awful and horrific radiation-based illnesses. We used observational data to to test, see what was going on there. It was never the purpose behind the test, but since the data was there, they did a lot of observational research. Pretty terrible stuff, so much so that one of the chief researchers that was involved in these experiments, someone named Dr. Joseph Hamilton, he worked at UC San Francisco. He urged the government in 1950, after he was done with these experiments, to stop. The Atomic Energy Commission, uh, who eventually became the Department of Energy, would be left open to, quote, considerable criticism, and that the research had, quote, a little bit of a Buchenwald touch. Buchenwald, of course, is a Nazi concentration camp that was that conducted forced medical experiments on its prisoners. What, did, what was the result of this? The Clinton Commission recommended that the government issue sincere and personal apologies to those that were affected and to provide financial compensation to their next of kin, or yeah. if, if they happen to survive. <laughs> and they also developed better safeguards to 
do these tests and to balance national security versus basically not being awful to the public. See, when someone my age watches uh, Stranger Things and the enemy is the Department of Energy, it always seems yeah. weird because, like, what a banal, like, that's not the evil government. And then you realize that there's plenty of uh, motivation for that that particular story choice. I had not made the Stranger Things connection, but you're totally right. Well, that's, that's the only thing I can think of where a fiction where the, the villain is the Department of Energy, of all things. Um, what well, I always loved in Ghostbusters how the villain was the EPA. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> that and the ghost. Um, all right, so that's all the new stuff that I have to talk about. Uh, you want to play a little game? Uh, yes. All right, so I got a nice fun game, game of chess. I got a nice, a nice little game here that we can break up this super depressing conversation. Shall we play a game? So of the 122 known vaults in the Fallout games, only 17 were made to public expectations of a place to wait out nuclear fallout. All others were designed to include some kind of social experiment, sometimes with a select few of inhabitants observing the occupants. Some of the other vaults had wacky motives. So I think it would be fun to play a round of the classic game, It's All Your Vault. <laughs> I'm going to describe to you a vault's purpose. You tell me whether or not it is real, i.e. it is from one of the Fallout <laughs> games, or it's just something I made up that seems like it could be in a Fallout game. I've got 19 of these. They're, they'll go by pretty quick. If you get more than half of them, I will mail you a prize. Oh my god, I didn't know this was going to happen. I would have I studied. Yep, I, I gave you the name of it, but it doesn't hopefully tell you anything. <laughs> but I think this will be fun. So here's two easy ones. So the first one, Vault 108. The vault housed a cloning lab, and all surviving residents are clones of one man named Gary. That is definitely true, though I actually have never made it to that vault, strangely enough. But I'm going to make a stop next time. Obstruction eliminated. It's a fun one, so that was definitely right. Vault 3. Residents in this vault were secretly implanted with a speaker in their ear. Every day, a golden retriever would bring them their food in a basket, and the overseer would use the speakers to make it seem as if the dog was talking. The experiment was to gauge how long it would take for someone to either believe the dog could talk or go insane. Is that real or fake? I mean, it sounds real enough, so I'll say real. Communism is a lie. That one was fake. Ah, okay. <laughs> that was one that my wife made up because she likes golden retrievers and, okay. wants, and wants them to be able to talk. I could picture it too well. It, it could be definitely in a Fallout game. Vault 42. No light bulbs of more than 40 watts were provided. So everything oh. was a little dim. Real or fake? I'm going to say fake. Communism is a lie. That one was real. Oh, it's, it was so minor that, that, that that's Voltex way, actually, sometimes. Yep, that one was listed in the Fallout Bible. So it wasn't any of the games, but it's considered canon. Okay. These, some of these are going to be tricky, but I, I thought they were fun. Um, vault 104. This vault is filled with people who are allergic to cats. After 30 days, 200 cats were introduced into the vault, and all tissue boxes were removed. Real or fake? Fake. Obstruction eliminated. That one was fake, yes. Okay. <laughs> Good one on that one. Um, although, again, I could see them doing that. They're awful. Mm -hmm. Vault 15. This vault is comprised of people from a diverse set of ideologies, races, and backgrounds. The goal is to see if people could just get along. Spoiler alert, they didn't. I'm going to say fake. Communism is a lie. That one was real. Ugh. That was in <laughs> Fallout 2. Okay. Well, but, I played an hour of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, and then that's died. perfectly fine excuse. <laughs> Vault 12 was in order to study the effects of radiation on the selected population, the vault door was designed to not close properly. Uh, true. Obstruction eliminated. That was a uh, Fallout 1. Okay. That cool. sounded, that sounds right. Yeah, I just, yeah. Excellent. Well, you're making, you're yep. even here at three to three. Oh, man. Okay. 
neck and neck with myself. Vault 70. Every door handle in this vault was designed with a 70% chance of producing a static shock. Mm, fake. Obstruction eliminated. Correct. Okay. That was when I just, I think that would be very irritating when you're already <laughs> having to survive a nuclear war and every time you grab a handle, it shocks you. Yeah. Uh, next one. Vault 77. Populated by one man and a crate full of puppets. <gasps> this lone inhabitant of the vault went insane from the lack of human contact and eventually abandoned the vault after murdering one of the puppets. Real I'm or fake? assuming, but I don't know if that's canon, but it's the comic. No, I think it is canon, so real. Obstruction eliminated. Yes. Okay. <laughs> is that So that's a comic? The It's called Penny Arcade. Is that one of the yeah, comics? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. They made something to go along with Fallout 3, and I'm assuming they made it with, with total permission, so I guess it, that makes it officially canon. <laughs> But good yeah. one. Excellent work there. <laughs> vault 99. All of the vault dwellers in this location were left-handed, but all of the desks, appliances, and other items were made for right-handed people. The vault's life support system failed on day 42 after a worker accidentally flipped the lever the wrong way. Real or fake? Uh, I'll say real, I guess. Communism is a lie. I made that one up. Okay. But there being 99, that's what made me doubt it the most. Because that's such a... It's a number you'd pick. You It'd know. be something else, yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. Vault 44. The residents of this vault in Boston were placed in the charge of an overseer who was previously a star player on a New York City baseball team. A mutiny ensued. Real or fake? Well, I haven't gotten there yet, but it sounds real. You going with real? Yeah. Communism is a lie. I made that one up. Ugh! But. <laughs> Tricked me with your level of detail. It sounds real. Um, okay. Vault 114. Intended to test the stress of living in impoverished, disenfranchised conditions by those previously accustomed to wealth and power. Residents were to be exclusively politicians and the wealthy elite, with the exception of the overseer who was previously homeless. <laughs> real that, or fake? That should be real. Um, fake? Communism is a lie. Fallout 4. Uh, yep. Curse you! Again, you may not have made it there yet. Mm -mm. All right, status check. Five yes, six no. Well, we're getting through this here. We have about halfway through. <laughs> Okay. The vault's purpose of Vault 21 was uh, gambling, reinforced by having only compulsive gamblers admitted as vault residents, and with all conflicts in the vault to be resolved through gambling. It is one of the few non-control vaults that didn't end in failure. Real or fake? Real? Obstruction eliminated. Correct. That was yeah. a little joke in Fallout New Vegas. Yeah, I thought so. The next one. Vault 120. The vault was made to slightly adjust the size of the vault interior each day, ever so slightly, such as the height of the ceilings, the width of doorways, etc. Residents suffered bouts of vertigo and eventually left the vault and died of radiation. That one's mean. <sighs> Real hmm. or fake? <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> I'm going to say fake. Obstruction eliminated. Correct. Okay. Uh, I made that one up. I just thought that would be really irritating if every day your desk was a little bit smaller and you couldn't figure out why. Oh, yeah. It's like what the Stasi used to do to people, but slightly less subtle. Yeah, like basically catfishing everybody. Uh, all right. So the next one, Vault 101. This vault was to... Uh, evaluate the performance of a dictatorial overseer in a closed community adopting a policy of isolationism. Never intended to be opened. Real or fake? That is real! Yep. Obstruction eliminated. Yep, that's our favorite vault. Or at least that's our mm -hmm. big one in Fallout 3. Um, Alright, so I think you're on your way here. Vault 72. This vault always smelled like freshly baked cookies, but there were <laughs> never any inside the vault. Vault dwellers slowly entered into a state of depression. 
real or fake? <laughs> Um, that's so hauntingly credible. Like, I can... Real. Communism is a lie. Oh, I made that one up. I, <laughs> I don't want to live in a world where that's actually true. Even video game-wise. Yeah, agreed. It's always smelling cookies and you can't find them. <laughs> vault 69. The vault had 1,000 people... And it was populated by 999 women and one man. Real or fake? Real. Obstruction eliminated. Totally real. That was in the Fallout Bible. Okay. I'm not sure if it was made into a game. I think it's referenced by the president in one of the games, but... It... I think it's also referenced in that weird puppet comic, the the Penny Arcade thing. I uh, think okay. that's why I suspected I think that was real. I think there's also a vault where it's the inverted one of those, mm-hmm. but I can't. I don't know which one that was. I didn't want to include both of them, um, but that's a freaky vault. Okay, Vault 95, populated solely with drug addicts, with the exception of a single Vault Tech employee who was undercover. Vault residents held therapy sessions as part of a rehab program, and everybody went clean. Until five years after the vault was sealed, a hidden stash of drugs was unlocked. Within a few days, all of the vault residents but one fell back into addiction and killed each other. Does that depressing vault sound real or fake to you? <laughs> fake? Communism is a lie. That one was real. Whoa! Yep. Fallout 3 cut material but mentioned in Fallout 4. Oh. God, Fallout really thinks drugs just are real bad. <laughs> yep, I, I didn't. We didn't even get into the fact that each of the drugs has like a real life equivalent. Like Mentats is supposed to be ADD type material drugs. Jet is, mm-hmm. I think Jet's supposed to be cocaine or maybe meth. Um, I'm not sure. Any kind of upper would make sense. Yep, and each of them has some sort of equivalent, but just you know, crazy. Uh, all right, vault number four. Residents of this vault were forced to watch the same movie every night. After three years, the residents started assuming the roles of the characters in the movie and lived their lives entirely in character. Until one day, the vault video player broke and everyone committed suicide. Real (laughs) or fake? Real. Communism is a lie. Oh, I made that one up. Oh, that was a good one. I like that one. I I think uh, I have a... I have a future career in just fan fiction. Future um, career in vault tech industries? I hope not. I hope not either. So I think you're, this last one is going to determine it. You're oh at, my god, the tension. I can't do it. This keeps happening crack. in games where it comes down to like the last one. But I think it's <laughs> 9 and 9 right now. So the last one, Vault 92. Populated largely by renowned musicians, this vault was a test bed for white noise-based system for implanting combat-oriented psychohypnotic suggestions. Real. Real or fake? Real it is. Obstruction eliminated. That's in New Vegas, I think. Uh, I remember that one. I think it's in Fallout 3, but you got it. it. All right, well, I remember, I, I, for some reason I remember that one. Yeah, there was like a bunch of music stands in that one, mm-hmm. I think. That was a freaky one. I remember going into that. And yeah, know. yeah, that is a good one. All right, so you won. Now I have to figure out a prize for you, and I'll mail it to you. Um... Well done. Well done. Strange game. The only winning mood is not to play. Okay. Feel good about myself now. My self-esteem has been raised. <laughs> you know your vaults. <laughs> um, you were locked in on that one. Okay. <laughs> so let's do our parking lot movie discussion. Or usually that's assuming that we watched a movie in the theater and we're outside talking about it in the parking lot. Well, obviously this isn't a movie. So I'm going to call this one Couch Chat, uh, since it's you're playing a video game and you're going to chat about it. So I have a couple questions, some of which were submitted by people that listen. Other ones I think would be interesting if there's something else you want to talk about. This is how we're going to wrap up and talk thematically. Uh, so feel free to inject something into it. Um, the first question, what is so appealing about role-playing games in the post-nuclear apocalypse? Why do we keep playing this game even though it's... It's very depressing in some ways, but it's also, it's different than other games. Why does this game in particular seem to have such a strong following there? That's a tough one because I'm pretty bad at speaking to like the the common man, even the common man who enjoys Fallout. I mean, as I say, I started with um, On the Beach when it came to this Mm -hmm. theme. And I think Fallout to me has, it's the combination of things that, as we discussed, doesn't 
seem like it should work together, but it does. Like the really brutal grimness and the humor and the kitsch. Um, and 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 through it all, you get to be a classic like gun toting badass wandering about mm-hmm. um, with with all this freedom of movement and choices. You know, am I going to be a racist jerk against ghouls or am I going to be nice? I mean, just. I don't know. I, I can't. I, I don't know if I know how to sum that up very well. Though there have been people who just who endlessly try to figure out like why are dystopias so popular and why uh, are we so obsessed with apocalypse and post-apocalyptic things. Mm-hmm. And I love all those. So my, uh, my morbid uh, cannot answer that very well, but I, it certainly applies to me. So <laughs> yeah, you, you should be you should be a subject of one of these experiments that people look into and try to figure out why that's so appealing. Yeah. I think I think you're hitting on a lot of stuff though that makes sense to me. The idea that these games are so diverse and you can play it one way and then play it again and you can it's a choose your own adventure story, I think is as yes. you put it you put <laughs> it in that article. It's like choose your own adventure story mixed with mad libs, where you can pick your own way of telling that story, like, Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this choice. Oh, but I saw this random encounter. Now I'm gonna put my own thoughts about what the background of it is. Now that I'm playing this way, I'm going to... It's essentially writing your own choose your adventure story. Yeah. There aren't a ton of black and white decisions in the game where it's just super clear, if I do this, I'm a good guy. If I do this, I'm a bad guy. They all have very gray choices. And I I think that is a way that keeps the game uh, having a longer impact. Yeah, I mean, that's my first sort of sandbox game. And I don't know, like, people went... People really like Skyrim, and even though I'm not crazy about fantasy, I'm definitely going to check it out at some point. But I've never really done a game where you have this kind of freedom before. And that's why it's hard for me to judge why people like Fallout when like so much about Fallout 3 felt like this revelation to me. And some of it was really basic stuff. Mm-hmm. Like When I first played it, the fact that it gets dark. Um, and yeah. I remember like my first tentative steps... <laughs> Into the wasteland when I was scared to like go into the super duper mart, like one of the first like buildings outside of the town you can go into. And you go into buildings, you get all claustrophobic, you get lost in the metro, and it gets grim and you actually feel kind of depressed, <laughs> but things change. You know, something funny might happen, you might meet an interesting uh, character. Um, but when it initially in those games, when it would be dark, I would feel this sense of like, like sort of this real world sense of like I'm stuck somewhere at, at night. How do I get home? Real emotion in a way that I just didn't know could happen from a video game. And I think other people figured this out before I did. I just wasn't, <laughs> wasn't paying attention for a decade there. Well, that's it's great you found your way to it and that games like this exist. Because, well, related to that, the second question I have is, this is from uh, Tim Collins, who I mentioned earlier. He was my special guest when we covered the movie Threads. He wanted us to talk about whether or not the Fallout games, because they have so much player choice, in them about how you can decide how you want to play it, how you want to approach the most basic level of good or bad, just what kind of story you want to follow, what side missions you want to do. Does it have the ability to have a consistent theme or a story? So when you end up with the game, you can have so many different endings. Is, is there a consistent story that's being told there? Or in another way is after you play so much, you play 40 plus hours and there's all kinds of different ways of, of uh, of choosing the game for a lot of people, as we mentioned, this is their first introduction to nuclear topics. What would they take away from that? Because it seems like they could either take away nukes are terrible and will destroy the world. And we should do something about that. Or science is bad. We should (laughs) avoid that. That's one way to look at it. Or humanity is going to survive. Uh, We can beat the odds. We we, will, no matter what happens, we're going to make it. So it's more important for us to be ready for when it happens. Like there's different ways you can approach a story. So is there, is there a consistent thing that people can take away from Fallout? I would say that you can take away whatever you want, depending on the story that you do. It's one of those games where you can almost bring your pre-existing notions of things, especially if whether or not it's pop culture or if it's just your general philosophy, and you can apply it to the Fallout game and how you want to play. So it's almost self-reinforcing. But there are some themes in nuclear uh, weapon related that you may get from it, but you can also take anything out of it. I don't know if can you as a player be expected to take something away from this game or is it just a free for all depending on the person? I'm not sure. I'm thinking again of those YouTube uh, videos, you know, things like um, I'm trying to think what it was, you know, it's always like fallout and you it's, it's the kind of thing that fallout games 
completely ape in their vault boy sort of instructional fake fake instructional videos <laughs> very real 50s and 60s things that seem incredibly tacky and bizarre to us today things like duck and cover with the turtle you know bert the turtle is very alert some like the average person might know duck and cover maybe even seen bert the turtle i don't know in school or something but as i said you see a lot of youtube comments where people are like oh it's just like fun and people are kind of going backwards so their association with the real world strange instructional things for for a decent chunk of people, the association is going to be Fallout, as opposed to you and I. We already knew how weird some of the stuff was before we started uh, playing the games. So when we so when we play it, we're like, "Wow, that's like that," instead of the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, and the the realization that it's it's retro future, and like I've seen, you know, it's well, the Jetsons was also sort of aping that, mm -hmm. and it was a little later, but you know, I, you know, I can picture pulp type things I've seen. Uh, you know, all, all these great magazine covers and stuff. Um, I mean, the games, you know, they tell us that war, war never changes, but that's sort of vaguely ambiguous, too. What is that? It's really just said mean? in that really deep, commanding voice of, uh, what's his name? Um, Ronnie Perlman. Yeah. When I play New Vegas, you know, my, my, my loyalties are with the followers of the apocalypse. Um, I also like the Kings, um, cause they don't really, you know, they don't, they're tough, but they're, they're, they're not going around conquering or anything. They just kind of want to hang out and imitate Elvis. <laughs> um, you know, I think some people are more comfortable playing someone really evil, but I'm still at the immersive stage where I'm like, I'm mostly... I mean, there are people who are who ally with the Legion in these worlds, and I, I'm not going to say that those people are literally ready to crucify anyone, but mm -hmm. I imagine that they're taking their personality and they can tell themselves a story where there's a world where the legion is justified enough mm -hmm. um they're playing wicked to an extent but in an immersive game you're taking your personality in this setting and i don't know if you can switch it off entirely you could take away what you want from fallout and game designers can't really expect the players to believe any sort of thematic conclusion to the game i i think that's always a i think it's a, it's a challenge for people who make games one of my other favorite games is Red Dead Redemption. And Oh, I've been told I should play that by several people. It's very it's very good. It's another one of these open world, you can play however you want kind of games. And I was listening to an interview with the designer of that game, and he was saying one of the challenges is, is that you want to tell the story. Because you want to tell, you're their storytellers at, at their heart. They're, if you write a book, like On the Beach is a very depressing book, not just a, a movie. Um, <laughs> And you, if you read that book, you will take away what the author is trying to tell you about nuclear weapons and war and survival and all of those things. Right. Fallout, it's like Red Dead Redemption, where you can kind of pick and choose how you want to tell this story. Red Dead Redemption has a narrative overall, and it tries to tell you to you know, be a good person who has had a previous life who was an outlaw, and you're trying to create a new life for yourself and your family, but there's just things you need to do. It's like an old Western story. Um, and but people are because it's so open world as a challenge for a game designer is how do you tell that when someone could be in the middle of a mission and just go I want to go over here now I want to kill all these bison or I want to attack these Indians how do you coalesce that with the story you're also trying to tell and it's like a trick they do little things like well if you leave the area then your mission failed Fallout tries to do versions of that I think Fallout 4 is much more restrictive about the story that you're trying to tell and as you mentioned, it's, there's this cognitive dissonance about I have to save my child, but I'm also building, <laughs> I'm helping these people build a shelter. I'm trying to move uh, this product from over here to over there. What's the purpose behind it? Why are you doing that while you're also trying to save your child? I think Fallout 4 suffers more from that storytelling problem than I still feel like 3 and if you end up, if you're playing 3 and you end up being an awful person and you side with the enclave and you do all of those things the game at the very end will tell you the capital wasteland proved a cruel inhospitable place and the lone wanderer ultimately surrendered to the vices that had claimed so many others selfishness greed cruelty these were the values that guided a lost soul through countless trials and triumphs. <laughs> right.
Right. Or it'll tell you... The Capital Wasteland proved a cruel, inhospitable place. And the lone wanderer ultimately surrendered to the vices that had claimed so many others. Selfishness, greed, cruelty. These were the values that guided a lost soul through countless trials and triumphs. So I think it depends on what you take away from it. So I, I think the game designers would be comfortable, those that made Fallout, not really caring about what people take away from this, because it's not really the purpose behind it. As opposed to, I don't know if you ever played The Last of Us. That's a PlayStation. Ooh, I've been dying to, but I never, I, I'm not around PlayStation. Yeah. It's like ever. The Last of Us is the best narrative storytelling I've ever had for a game. Ooh, I want to play that. <laughs> that game will, you will know what it's trying to tell you at the end. Yeah. Okay. It comes away from a certain perspective. Same thing with like uh, Bioshock. Um, and that may be why this is not a good teaching tool if you're trying to teach someone about the dangers of nuclear war, if that's your perspective, or if you're trying to show people why it will survive no matter what, it's still difficult because it depends on what you bring into it, not just what yeah. you took away from it. I think the games push you a little bit towards being good. I mean, there's the karma system. Um, and again, like I couldn't, I couldn't have Liam Neeson dad be disappointed in me. That would just be so upsetting. <laughs> but at the end of the day, like the game kind of wants you to be nice to ghouls and be tolerant and like do what Liam Neeson would want you to do. But you have a choice, which is to my mother who's i don't know she's played like mist i think but that's about it in her life um like like you can do all this horrible stuff but you have all these choices and that's i think that is one of the revelatory <laughs> things about the game for me when i first started playing it was like i have the i have this choice it's not poor mario i keep like I, mario's great i'm not like being insulting but like you know you know jumping on the 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 koopa's head and like that, that's i mean it's you know, it's it's this challenge, but it's not choosing anything. Um, and you don't know what that Koopa's life is like while they're there. <laughs> right. His dreams. Because they're not like um, they're going after you. They're walking back and forth, and you happen to run into them. No, <laughs> I will say that in follow. I agree that it's not. You know, it's not a clear cut message of like it's not the pacifist message that like I would somehow try to impart if I was making a video game. But some of the little details, you know, the skeletons in the bathtub with a toaster or in the bathroom with the gun or the uh, syringe or the, the diaries on the, um, uh, on the computers talking to the ghoul who tells you about the bombs. Like there are these details that are telling you how bad this was. You know, you're never going to get the message that this was a good thing that happened to humanity. And, but they're, unless, they're you're, actually... unless you're talking to the, the children of Adam people, but they're crazy. That's true. The game doesn't rub it in your face. Um, it, it's not screaming at you with this message. It's giving you little details, little stories, little snippets of these uh, fictional lives. And I think that's another reason why I love it. So here's my last question. This is related to this. Would this make a good movie? An adaptation was in the works as far back as 1998. But in uh, 2016, Todd Howard of Bethesda Softworks uh, turned down the offer of making a game. So it's a possibility, but... It's uh, it's never really happened. But do you think this would make a good movie, the Fallout story, because of the fact that it's so up to you? Well, um, it references so many other things, but I hate The Force Awakens. I hate things that are just like grabbing me by the collar and screaming, remember that thing you liked better than this? This mm -hmm. is kind of like that. But a really good remix that really takes a bunch of different elements and mixes them well, or even does a brave attempt, like the 100, even if it's not like amazing, I appreciate that. So Fallout may reference uh, A Boy and His Dog and Mad Max and There Will Come Soft Rains huh. and On the Beach and all these other things. Um, and you might think it's kind of tired, but you know, it could make something really good. And you wrote on our show notes, what about uh, Netflix... A series and i immediately was like yes yeah i think and uh like, in my head right now i'm imagining different characters you said each time so like maybe a classic like gun-toting badass in one but like a ghoul or a super mutant or a raider give them yep. some humanity in the next one i'm i desperately want this to exist starting right now <laughs> well i think it'd be like a black uh mirror black mirror where it's every episode is something thematically similar but different um, than the previous ones. They're not the same thing. 
I think a story like that, that system would be really entertaining. I want that to exist so badly now. <laughs> I don't know how we make that happen. I'm going to write a very nice, strongly worded letter to both Netflix and Todd Howard to make this happen. Any kind of anthology series like set in a post-apocalyptic world like that. No, I'm just like, I, I, I'm like literally I'm distracted right now imagining what this would look like and how much I want it to exist. So, yes, let's have that exist in the world, please. All right. As soon as I make my first uh, <laughs> my first ten million dollars, I will finance it. Uh, all right. Sounds good. Let me know. I'll try to help. Um, so rating system. Let's get let's end this out here. Uh, we usually rate each content whether it's a movie tv book video board game anything like that uh out of five so that we're consistently rating something across our podcast history here um but we also like to finally tune and tailor it so that we're getting at just the rating that would be relevant to the content so i want to rate this one here one out of five bottles of cool refreshing nuka cola on the wall so how many of these would you take down and pass around or if you want to keep it to yourself like the game the choice is yours how would you uh, rate this? One being the least, five being the best. May I rate the three titles I've played for more than an hour individually? You can. Because I, okay, I would give Fallout Four four delicious bottles of Nuka Cola so far. Uh, I will pass those around. Um, let's say New Vegas is like four point three. Okay. <laughs> Just to be difficult. Yeah. And let's give Fallout 3 4.75. 4.75. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's a good amount of, uh, of bottles there. I think you must have poured some of it out for your fallen brother. Yeah. 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 I had to. Pour one out for your mother. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think uh, I'm going to loop them together because I haven't. I think about New Vegas. It, I enjoyed it, but I just don't think about it very much. I know people love it. But it mm-hmm. just it just didn't click for me, even though, like I mentioned earlier, I enjoyed Fallout 3 because it was in D.C. and it was such a, a strong emotional connection. New Vegas was fun because I went to Las Vegas a lot growing up in Southern California. Um, I liked Fallout 4's world because uh, my now wife, then girlfriend, was finishing law school in Boston. So I enjoyed seeing all the places that I was currently visiting uh, in Boston. So that was fun. Because of the fact that Fallout 4 loses a lot of the things I liked about 3 in New Vegas, I didn't enjoy having to build all the shelters, but I know I didn't have to do that. But I did (laughs) because I thought it would matter, and it didn't. But you felt obligated. (laughs) Yeah, I I thought it would be fun to build a that first place, what is it called, like a sanctuary. Sanctuary, yeah. Building a wall all the way around it. You know, oh, it does nothing. It does nothing. nothing. They just will still, <laughs> the bad guys will spawn in the middle of the room. And I, I think there was, I had this existential crisis of why did I just spend 10 hours building this place <laughs> when it doesn't matter? And I thought, oh, man. <laughs> and then you could probably go even meta, why are you playing video games at all? Because it doesn't matter. Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> I didn't go that far because I, I enjoyed Fallout 3 and 4, Fallout 3 in New Vegas because of the story. It was, is why would you read a book if it doesn't? doesn't do anything for your life it, relative to video games. There's, if you have a good video game that's a good storytelling mechanism, it's enriching your life through story, and you take themes away. You can have conversations. It's good fodder for a three-hour podcast. It's good for that, and I think Fallout 4 just didn't reach it for me. So I'm going to give overall 4.5 bottles, and that's because of how strong 3 and New Vegas are. And I okay. bet if I play Fallout 1 and 2, if I enjoy them, I bet it will increase it even more because four, it's not one that I ever go back to Mm -hmm. after I played it. The graphics are really great, but just there's so many mechanics of the game and storytelling that I just don't enjoy as much. But I want you to finish four and let me know uh, (laughs) what you think about the endings and all that kind of stuff. So I think that'd be maybe you'll uh, your rating for four will either go up or down from from four. I'm really not sure where it's going to go. As I said, I love the noir stuff that kind of like the, the, the vibe and with the bar and like yep. the torch singer and the, I mean, a r- robot detective. Like, how can I not be overjoyed when I find the robot detective? All right. So real quick, we we're executive producers of the Netflix anthology series Fallout. We're going to do our episode with Nick Valentine. Who do you cast as Nick Valentine? The, <laughs> the, the, synth, the detective synth. Oh. Or the synth detective. <laughs> I guess 
my hmm. you need somebody more gristled. I'm there's a lot of really good postmodern detective stories like The Singing Detective, which is why I knew about the ink spots, and uh Brick with Joseph Gordon Levitt, who is too hmm. still kind of too pretty and too young in some ways to be Nick Valentine. Though if you're a robot, maybe that doesn't matter. Um where that's a film noir set in high school. So I don't I don't know. My 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 frequent answer is some awesome unknown, so you don't associate them with them with anyone else. But then, I just want I just want to watch that, and it doesn't exist. It's so upsetting. Well, would you watch it if you let me cast it? Which I wanted to give Colin Farrell a chance to play a better detective because um, um, I didn't like True Detective season two very much. Uh, not really a controversial opinion, but I think if you have him as like a grizzled, older detective, maybe you give him a little uh, more white hairs and his mustache and you have him be nick valentine i would like that he's good he does a good american accent too so i can i can dig it i mean i just i'll just be happy to be watching this show great well hopefully we can make it a reality um (laughs) but stuff that is a reality that people that may enjoy our conversation or may enjoy fallout i think it would be fun to go through and talk about some things that you'd recommend to people to to follow through with that so i'll let you go first as the guest here uh, what are some of the things you would recommend to people to check out? Oh, there's too many. I already mentioned a couple. Um, a Canticle for Leibowitz is kind of my Fallout 3. Not to say that I won't reread it potentially or I won't replay Fallout 3, but for, to both of them, I had such a strong reaction that I'm almost afraid hmm. to go back and experience them again because they're so whoa. What's Canticle that? for Leibowitz is this beautiful, um, strange novel about life in a very post-apocalyptic um, world. And the ending, you, you'll get the message. Uh, we talked about the the ambiguity of Fallout, but Canada Completely Woods, you're going to get the message. And the message is very depressing. Right now I'm reading a book called Swan Song, which is kind of how I imagine uh, The Stand to be, but I've never read The Stand, um, in that it's sort of a post-apocalyptic good versus evil, like, vaguely magical stuff happens Mm -hmm. um but it's like a post nuke thing and it's pretty grim um and it feels like really like top tier stephen king in writing as well um and it's like absurdly long and that's kind of intriguing my my standbys are though um and i have a weird soft spot for the show jericho okay which is really cheesy in certain ways. I mean, it stars Ski Ulrich. It has some really good, intense moments, and it's one of the only shows where the sort of conflict between humans is, like, not obnoxious and a distraction from, like, the more interesting apocalyptic stuff. In season two, for Libertarian, it's, like, it's good fodder for Libertarian, and it also has that sort of New Vegas, choose your alliances, kind of having a little war type thing i don't know i i enjoy it i wish there was more of it um i have a million more apocalypse things on my stag blog under apocalypse project and i'm absolutely going to update it soon because i have so many more things to write about because i've been on this kick for like three years now and it's not stopping so i'm glad to know that it's not just me so i appreciate being a fellow (laughs) me too (laughs) so i have a couple things to follow that uh if i can uh metro 2033 It's a video game series based on a series of Russian novels, I think by the same name. The group follows survivors in Russia uh, after a nuclear war that live inside the subway tunnel system, which was the heart of Russia's civil defense approach. They said, why would we build more fallout shelters when we have these gigantic tunnel systems? People just go in there and we'll seal off the tunnel. Well, that happens, and... Much like Fallout, uh, radiation does more than just <laughs> affect your cells and cause you to be sterile. It causes giant werewolf monsters and other things like that. Um, Naturally. I'm still, so I'm still working through that game. Uh, there's a new edition that's coming out soon. So I think I need to finish it before I, uh, I get around to seeing the new one. Uh, so that's one I, I would recommend people to check out if they like Fallout. I'm sure you've already heard of it if you haven't. But I would check out the novels. I, I looked through them a little bit, uh, and I've enjoyed seeing what I've, what I've read so far. I would also check out The Road, which I've already mentioned. It's a 2006 book by Cormac McCarthy, who also wrote books like Blood Meridian um, and some other stories. And it was a 2009 movie with uh, our friend Viggo Morrison um, from Lord of the Rings. He does a very good job for if you just want to watch the movie, telling a story that's way more bleak than <laughs> Fallout ever could possibly be. But I still think that it's it's worth seeing. It's one of the best 
novels about uh, the environment and collapse of civilization, how it can slowly happen. And I think Fallout, uh, it, it, it serves as a good foil to Fallout to say humanity can survive in some way, but it won't be as cute and fun as, <laughs> as the Fallout world might be. So I think play those there two will, things. There will be no together. robot butlers. None. None so much in the road. <laughs> Um, you don't find just like some, uh, you don't find like iguana bits in the road on the ground. They find like a rotten apple and then that's about it. Although there is a scene in the movie with Coca-Cola and a scene in the book with Coca-Cola where the kid like gets this flat Coca-Cola from a vending machine. So oh, that is very Fallout, isn't it? Very Fallout, yeah, with Nuka cola I'd also recommend a couple articles that I'll post on here that's about radiation, human radiation experiments that were shared to me. Uh, by at distant wolf on Twitter. I'll put them to the show notes. They're if you can weather them, they're very hard to to read. But it is fascinating look into a period in our life where we didn't have the kind of ethics and morals that people would say we have now when when it comes to science experiments. Um, and finally, I'll recommend the article by uh, lovely Umayam who wrote uh, on the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist an article entitled "Why the Excitement Over Post Nuclear War Game Fallout 4." When Fallout 4 was coming out, I was trying to write an article about this series because I've written articles about Game of Thrones uh, in Nukes and Dragons. I've written articles about Star Wars in Nukes uh, and the Death Star. And I really wanted to do one on Fallout 4, but she beat me to it. And it's way better than anything I ever could have written. <laughs> so I would check that out. She works at the Stimson Center as a scholar. And it's one just to check out as a, a good connection of discussing. She's very good at talking about nuclear narratives. Uh, and she does a really good job of applying that uh, to the video game series. So if you have listened to this three-hour podcast and you think we're all goofy for talking about it as long as we have, there's actual people that study this thing that think it's worth talking about. Lucy, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Oh, my God, taking... it was so much fun. Thank uh, you for giving in to my literal demand to be a guest on the podcast. <laughs> well, it works out well. Uh, you're someone who has written on this stuff, and I'm glad to actually have a conversation about this. I know you're on Twitter at Lucy Stag, uh, mm-hmm. S-T-A-G. Yep. You have, we talked about the stagblog.com. Uh, where else can people find your work? Anywhere else you want to point people to? I haven't updated my blog lately, tragically. Um, Twitter is the, is the easiest place to go if you wanted to see my articles about political stuff. Unfortunately, I have yet to find someone to pay me to write about nuclear fiction. But, you know, the dream still lives. Um, if you want to be entertained by irritated political articles, you can find me on Twitter. Well, maybe we can contact Netflix and they can pay us to be writers slash executive producers. Because this (laughs) needs to happen. If someone's not going to do it, we need to do it. I know. Uh, So good. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Super Critical Podcast. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or you want to tell us what we got wrong, there's a couple ways you can contact the show. Facebook.com slash supercritical is how you reach us on Facebook. We're also on Twitter at Nuclear Podcast and email the old-fashioned way, supercriticalpodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the program, we'd really appreciate it if you would consider subscribing on iTunes. Leave a review there and also tell us what your favorite Fallout encounter is. If you leave us five stars and you mention that, I'll talk about it on Twitter. Maybe that's the way we can bait you into to leaving a five-star review. But anyways, I'd love to hear that, whether over Twitter or Facebook or Gmail, anything like that. Until next time, this has been Tim Westmeyer and Lucy. And remember, if it's pop culture and radioactive, we are bound to get super critical about it. Have a good one out there, vault dwellers.